We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And yes, faintly in the background, there is something going on with my fire alarm system. We tried to wait a little while in our you know little this me of? preamble. You ever see Bringing That Baby with Cary Grant and uh, Captain Hepburn? Oh, Hubbard? no, I haven't. I haven't. Oh, my God. I haven't watched at it. Seven, at, at the tone, the time will be uh, 728. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of. We just watched Bringing That Baby with the kids. That's right. It I... was amazing. Yeah, I no, uh, so I, I apologize. This was clearly not planned. I've never actually heard my fire alarm intercom thing make this particular chime before. If the alarm's actually going off, it's it's a lot more rapid and loud. So I don't know what's going on. Hopefully it won't be too distracting. You'll just tune it out in your brain eventually if it goes on the entire podcast. I do apologize, but uh, we got no other time to move this recording time. So here we go. And we have a gazillion questions. So yeah, yeah. we do. Yeah. And I have a new pop filter. See? Oh, yeah. It attaches to the mic. You it's do. not that big old round thing. Uh-huh. Happy? I'm very excited about it. <laughs> I have no idea if it's going to work very well. I have the, the reports on whatever were... So somebody who listens to this podcast, because uh-huh. I don't listen to it, will have to tell me if they notice a bunch of like plosives and stuff. Oh, I see. Yeah, because yeah, that's what it's supposed to fix. All right. This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ring a bell a whole bunch of times. Yeah. <laughs> then yep. Rob will come out in the hallway and find out what's going on and answer your AV questions. <laughs> Hopefully, you live somewhere near Canada. Because uh, that's where That's Rob a big lives. country. It's a big country. There's not that many people there, though. So, that's you know, true. Got some space. Anyhow, uh, get your questions answered. Email us at question at avrant.com. You come to www.avrant.com and uh, leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash avrant podcast. Twitter, well, no. Uh, YouTube.com slash avrant. We, are, we will completely ignore your question and or block you. Because <laughs> that seems to be what's going on over there. <laughs> I need to drink some of my water. Uh, if you want to reach us directly, it's rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. I guess it's on the screen if you're watching the YouTube If you're watching YouTube, version. we have a new lower third. We're going to be thanking Ash multiple times, but thank you, Ash, for that new lower third. Yep. And uh, if you want to reach me directly, it's tom at avrant.com uh, or uh, at avrant underscore tom for my Twitter. All right. Uh, start the podcast. We always want to thank our listeners for the week to become a listener in a week. All I have to do is support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is by going to www.avrant.com and click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. That will take you to a PayPal donation site. And this week, we will thank Robert for his donation. That will go into our coffers to help pay for our... It's gone. Did you oh, mute I, yourself? I muted myself there momentarily. I heard oh. sirens coming, so maybe... Uh... <laughs> Maybe, Maybe you really should leave the building. No, we, that's not even our protocol in here. Uh, if it's what do you mean? It's not your protocol. If it's a we fire, don't, you don't leave if, the building. If it's on the floor, you go two floors down. If it's not on your floor, you don't even move, or not within two floors of you, you don't even move. But what if it's below you? Well, then there'd be smoke coming up or something. And then they, I don't you're not care. supposed to. It's never real. <laughs> It's a concrete it's never, building. What the heck is going to catch on fire news. anywhere? Rob's got it, fake <laughs> news, fake fire news. It's never real. That's why they say don't even, but we used to leave the building and then we had, it's uh, there's always a false it alarm. It sounds like pandemonium over there. What are you talking about? You can't, the fire department comes if the fire alarm goes off. This is what we pay them to do. It's fine. It's never real. <laughs> So I will say right now, and I'm in all seriousness, if if Rob dies in this fire, I am very sorry that I laughed as much as I just I, did, and I am all, sorry also for all the jokes I'm about to make. I'm not even so, that high high up. I could dangle off my balcony if it comes to that. I'll be fine. All right, more hints about where Rob lives. Some place in the first couple of floors. All right, we want to thank Robert for his donation. Those those monies will go into our coffers to help pay for hosting fees and apparently pop filters, which costs like two dollars. So thank you very much, Robert. Yes, Robert, thank you very much for the donation. That was a, a lengthy way to get there, but there you are. Thank you, Robert. We also want to thank our 61 patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon is a website where you can sign up to have a monthly 
donation taken out of your bank account and process through them and give it to us. It happens once a month. The minimum is $1. The maximum is infinity. We want to thank all 61, but in particular, we want to thank Jorge or George. I it is think Jorge. it's probably Jorge, yeah. who uh, let us know that he was one of our patrons. So thank you very much, Jorge, and all the 60 other patrons yeah that is uh, patreon.com slash av rant podcast if you would like to sign up thanks so much to our 61 patrons and jorge thank you for being one of them i also want to thank uh any other listener that can support the podcast in any other way it doesn't have to be financial you just have to figure out some way to do it and then let us know i'm going to really adjust my mic so we want to thank michael who let S- uh, hsu or shoe know that he bought a VTF3 Mark V HP thanks to advice from AV Rent. He'll replace he'll be replacing a pair of VTF2 Mark IVs they had co-located for more output. So that's good. Now you just need another one. So thank you Michael. <laughs> that's right. Michael, uh, thank you very much for the support and congratulations on your purchase. And since we hit 600 episodes, we mm-hmm. asked our listener, Ash, to create us a new logo, and he did. So we want to thank Ash for our new 600 logo and the lower third that if you're watching us on YouTube, you are enjoying right now. Yes, we love Ash's artwork, so thank you so much uh, for doing that. Really, really appreciate it, Ash. Thank you. My microphone keeps dipping. All right. <laughs> Too so heavy I, with this new pop filter. It's not the new pop filter. I it's know. because I tried to I, – I love my shock mount. Because yes. it means I don't I don't have to worry about it that much. But the shock mount is that such, I want it to be straight, mm. but I, there's no straight on it. It's very annoying. And when I try to put it straight, in order for it to be so that you, it, visually it's as as small as possible, mm-hmm. I have to turn it to the side. But then it's too heavy and the whole thing falls down. So it's a first world problem. In news this week, we have Vizio's flagship P series uh, Quantum TV became available last week. It's only available in one size, 65 inches, and the price is $2,100. Reviewed.com seems to be the only news outlet that got a review sample in advance, and while they proclaim it to be the best TV, Vizio TV ever and confirm that it delivers more than the promised 2000 thousand nits of peak brightness for eye searingness that we all love they also caution uh they uh it, 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 yep. it, it, that's right wait a second. Promise it. they also caution that even with 192 zones of local dimming the black level is raised especially in hdr mode with a rather disappointing 0.15 nits for hdr black on an ansi checkerboard pattern which means it's not black it is not no i mean you're aiming for 0.05 under the uh premium what what is the name of the thing i've forgotten already uh you know the ultra hd premium specification they're aiming for 0.05 in the black level which still is slightly raised in a completely black room you'd still see that that is not true true black but yeah they measured 0.15 so that's actually significantly higher um kind, kind of gray in those blacks yeah so it's mostly recommended for bright rooms with ambient light, at least for uh, from this. And, and the, I get the moment there's only this one review. So this one review said that. So yeah, we'll see if, if other else. other reviewers get different results, hopefully. But uh, nonetheless, it might just be a really good bright room TV. That might be what it turns out to be, which isn't such a bad thing to be. So there you go. It's all it's awfully big. It's big. Samsung announced that they begin mass producing micro LED display similar to the wall that was shown at CES in September ahead of expected availability for, quote, wealthy customers. <laughs> I guess not quote is like in parents, wealthy customers yeah. in 2019. All right. So this is the thing uh, where it is, you know, little LED lights that you, you very little on yeah. your wall, you know, like in you can build a display. Is it done? It's done. They must have turned ah. it off. Told you false alarm. Yeah. You don't know. Maybe the alarm guy who's <laughs> ringing the bell got burnt up by the fire. <laughs> I guess that's my new fire alarm. At least it's not as terrible as the old. The old one was like, you couldn't even think. So, yeah. Well, that's you, better. You're I'll take this. You're supposed to think, I better get out of this building. This noise is annoying. <laughs> <laughs> now you think, oh, that's not so I can bad. Deal with that. I'm going to stick around and finish no. my podcast. No, that's right. Absolutely, I will. I always will. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's, it, this is this thing that you can build like an entire wall yeah. you know, of these little LEDs, and it would be a display, so you can scale it up as much as you want. Uh, they're saying it will be a luxury display, but also said it won't be as expensive as many people expected slash feared. Mm-hmm. I really have to drink some water. No <laughs> solid details on price or size, but the plans, but uh, just the plans themselves are being announced much sooner than anticipated. So we don't know anything other than, hey, yeah, I know you guys thought we might actually do this for rich people. 
we just totally going to do this for rich people. <laughs> yep. The rich, rich people are already asking for it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, these are the micro LED displays. So this is, uh, it's not the same tech as that cinema LED display that they were, the Onyx that they've announced uh, where they're actually installing in full size cinemas, the 34 foot wide screen. That's a different thing. Those are LEDs, one LED per sub pixel. These are micro LEDs. So this was the 146 inch display that they had, mm. the wall that they showed at CES. Um, no word if it's going to be a smaller version for this luxury micro LED display that they're actually going to sell to consumers in 2019. Uh, but just the mere fact that you will be able to buy the thing, that's much sooner than anticipated. It was thought there was at least three, possibly as much as 10 years away. Uh, wow. But it's, it's yeah. in fact one year away. So really not too bad. There we go. Sony held a press event on Tuesday, July 31st in New York, where they officially announced their fl new flagship Master Series TV models, the A9F OLED and the Z9F LCD. They tallied a Netflix, cal Netflix calibration mode and AutoCal using CalMan software for all release. Official price is not announced. Netflix calibrated mode. Yes, the Netflix calibrated mode is something they were touting quite a bit. And uh, so it only works with Netflix. And it is exclusive to Sony because it is a Sony Netflix partnership that created That's this lovely. thing. Uh, and they're like, the whole, the reason they called it the Master Series is like, this is as close as you can get to a mastering display. Uh, from a consumer display. That's their goal oh, with this God. one OLED and you this know one what's LCD. what's happening at this very, very moment? What's that? If and then Gary is ordering one. Oh, I know. Right now, no, <laughs> he is literally unquestionable. He has stopped listening to this podcast. I don't. He doesn't and like he bright, is. and he doesn't like HDR. So the chances that he actually will want this are actually kind of low. Um, but right. yeah, no. The the mastered for Netflix or Netflix uh, calibrated mode. Um, supposedly the idea is, hey, it's a one button thing. You put it into that mode, and you are seeing Netflix the way that the Netflix people want you to see it. Um, in my opinion, it probably amounts to turning off the soap opera effect because they, they actually harped on that for a little right. bit. I'm like, the rest of it, I, if you you know have a cinema mode, your contrast and brightness and color settings should be pretty accurate already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, good. I'm, I'm happy to have it. I wish it was actually applicable to things other than only Netflix and only the built-in Netflix, right? Only the built-in app. But anyway, that's what they're doing, right. kind of a cool thing. It seems very stupid, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> it, feels, yeah. it seems like an... Uh, uh, a DSP mode on the Yamaha receiver. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's there, yeah, I guess. A little more yeah, useful little, than that. It's almost yeah. like a straight decode mode. Right. 89F, uh, A9F OLED X1 Ultimate Processing Chip, I guess, is what this, what is this? What these are, are these are sort of the, the rumored specs. These, these oh, all right, leaked all right. out early. Uh, hasn't been fully confirmed. Some of it has, but uh, we're just, we're doing the things that we're expecting or, or rumored. So the, I guess the, the new displays will have the Ultimate Processing yeah. Chip, whatever that is. The A9F will have 900 nit. Uh, Nits Peak. Uh, it's got a 3.2 channel acoustic surface audio plus. Uh -huh. The next one's going to be audio plus Z. That's right. X. X, X audio. Got to have the X, yeah. <laughs> and the option to use a speaker wire binding post in a center speaker mode. So, I guess. Yeah, so the actual fine. surface of the TV itself on these OLEDs is your speaker. It has no other speakers built in. And they've gone back to the, the kickstand easel design. So the thing does lean back on you. Not a huge fan yeah. of that, but that's what they're doing with it. Uh, but yeah, the, the idea is that the entire surface of the OLED vibrates. They now have three actuators a left center and a right actuator instead of only two actuators. Uh, and then I can't imagine any idea that's that any boardroom that where that idea came out and somebody and say wait wait what we're gonna vibrate the picture isn't that gonna yeah. is, isn't that a bad idea they vibrate the picture it works and uh, yeah. interestingly something some people have requested which is uh, now they're actually gonna have a pair of binding posts right on the Just back of the, the TV so they can turn your TV into your center channel that's right you send your receivers center speaker output via speaker wire it doesn't have to have a pre out uh, to the TV and your TV is now your center speaker so given that there is no so if you want space, perfect timbre matching you're uh, oh, gonna yeah. have to buy like seven of these but there's no space at all below this screen right there's the teeny tiny little less than an inch thick bezel so there's nowhere to put even a sound bar so like all right i guess your tv is the sound yeah yeah so it's supposed to be four thousand dollars for the 55 inch and 5500 for the 65 inch the z9f the lcd it'll have the same processor somewhere between 600 and 1500 local dimming zones <laughs> yeah sony for won't say how many so people are guessing all right. Well, I mean, between zero and infinity, then. <laughs> First consumer TV rumored to hit 4,000 nit peak. So essentially, no need for tone mapping if true. Uh, rumored 3,500 for 65 inch and 6,000 for the 
75 inch and I, I don't think any of those prices are right i think the oleds yeah. are too expensive and i think the lcds are too inexpensive with those i was gonna prices, say because so. I, if you look at the price of that compared to the price of the vizio that we know is 65 inches and right. is coming out at 2100 there's no way that sony is three yeah the z9f no there's got to be at least 4500 i mean the, the z9d least, yeah. was when it first came out so yeah. i think the lcd prices that were rumored are a thousand dollars too cheap and i think the uh, oled prices that are rumored are about five hundred dollars too expensive i don't think they actually will charge that much so hmm. yeah but uh, yeah, that was the big event. Lots of people were talking about it today and uh, and some kind of cool stuff. Um, the Z9F, apparently, uh, they were all touting that uh, being an LCD and using vertically aligned panels, VA panels, uh, the big thing that is usually a problem is as soon as you go to either side, the colors and the contrast drops way off on LCDs. Yeah. Uh, and supposedly, and people have seen it in person now, they're like, they really improved that. It's still not an OLED, but they really improved it. So good on them. Cause... So we'll probably talk about this next week, but I yeah. got a BenQ display in the monitor in oh, okay. review. Uh, I, I can't tell you which one it is right now because yeah. I don't remember. For your but computer, it's like a right? Thir- for a computer, yeah, for the gaming computer. So, so my kids have been using it for gaming. It's 32 inches, and I sit, like, stupid close to this thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I sit close enough that I have to, like, you know, move my head to go from one end to the other, but I am real close. And this is a... I'm like, this is the first time I thought that 4K really mm. made a huge right. difference. And it would and when it you're does. that close to that larger display. Sure. Like, I go back to my 1080p display, which is also pretty big. It's not that big, but it's like a... Double, the 21 by 9 so it's got like mm-hmm. two 16 by 9 screens in one screen uh which i really liked uh now that thing looks blurry compared mm. to this other thing right so i mean I, I didn't think it would make that much of a difference but it does look really good it's got like a simulated hdr mode and stuff like that in it so i'm, I'm gonna the thing i'm waiting for is i just haven't hooked up the blu-ray player to it and right used you know looked at real hdr content uh to just been i haven't had time there was one disappointing thing on those master series sony tvs where uh no variable refresh rate gamers were really hoping for that of course samsung is doing it uh but sony is not and they they confirmed that they are not so that's it for that all right all right excuse me comments david david brought a mini dsp why I must say, I like Y Dog. I know you like Y Dog. That's why I put it in there so many times so you could say it. Thank you. The Mini DSP Y Dog Netflix (laughs) network to USB bridge so he can make changes to his Mini DSP without having to plug it into his computer with the USB cable every time. He says, bottom line, it works. Mm. He can sit on his couch with his laptop and make changes without having to disconnect his Mini DSP from his audio system now. But a couple of little quirks. You can't use the Y Dog to update the Mini DSP's firmware. firmware. That still requires plugging it directly into a computer with the USB cable. And the Y Dog ethernet port is only good for controlling the y dog and the mini dsp directly so you can't use it to connect to your home network only wi-fi for that so there's that yep all right well thank you david right. for uh, for letting <clears throat> us know about that uh, that device and that ultimately it does what it was designed to do you can sit on your couch and you can change things on your mini dsp totally needed and that's a good thing yeah. how much did that thing cost do we remember uh, i think it was uh, 80 bucks 79 bucks yeah, sounds about right i think that's okay. right yeah. uh let's get into the questions here because we got a lot mm. caesar Caesar has a Sony uh, 75X940E TV and the Marantz SR6011 receiver. He can't seem to get the sound from Sony's built-in apps to play through his Marantz via a, uh, HDMI, ARC, or audio return channel. Yeah. Can we sort it out for him? I'm sure Rob can, but I'm going to tell you right now, dude, I, I you might be beating yourself up about this. I want to I want to give you a pass right now. Oh, this yeah. is the AV rant obs- uh, uh, absorption from guilt about this because invariably it's, it's some combination of hdmi uh, cec which is uh i can't remember what consumer or something display i'm not sure if it was uh consumer or control display. consumer C-C- electronics control, control consumer something, something control like anyways control. the hdmi cc that that goes on with these things that's going to be part of it and the other part is that menus are made by people who apparently have never met another human being that that, that they yeah put things in the the kind of order where you're like what? <laughs> right. It's like going through somebody else's my documents uh, folder. And go. Why is this folder under here and this one? You know. So yep. yes, Rob, fix it. I I will attempt to. So first on your Marantz, which makes this way more complicated than it needs to be. Although it's kind of like for an enthusiast setup, they give you all the options, but that makes it more complicated. So let's get your Marantz ready for audio return channel first. You want to press the setup button on your remote. You'll want to go to the video section and then the HDMI setup uh, section within the video section. Now okay. there you have three different things all relating 
to HDMI CEC and HDMI ARC. So there is the HDMI control. That is their name for HDMI CEC. Okay. Technically speaking, you do not have to turn that on. On most AV receivers, you do, but on this Marantz, technically you don't because they have an entirely separate HDMI ARC menu, which you can turn on independent of the control. So you okay. for sure have to turn on the ARC. If you turn on the HDMI control, it will automatically turn on the ARC as well. Okay. But you can turn on ARC independent of control if you want to. Then there's a third one that is called TV audio switching. And that is when your, when your AV receiver detects that an audio signal is being sent from your television, it will automatically put itself into the TV audio input mode uh, for the TV audio so that you do not have to manually put it into TV audio to hear the audio that's being sent from your television via ARC. That is also independent. So you can turn that on so that your TV automatically switches to TV audio. If you do not turn that on, you have to use your remote. And thankfully on the SR6011, they actually put the TV audio amongst the other input buttons. On my SR7010 from the year previous, that TV audio button is kind of hidden up in a different section of the remote. <laughs> I had to go so searching for it. If you have a Harmony and you're... Right. You wouldn't have to do that last one. You yeah, if just... you have a Harmony, you can tell your Harmony to turn your Marantz to the TV audio mode when that's what you want to do as part of your activity. Right. So if you have a Harmony, what I would do is turn on ARC and then have your Harmony do the rest right. of it. That's because right. Because that gives... I would leave HDMI control off. Yes. Because I don't want... Whatever the awfulness that That's could come right. out of that. <laughs> yeah. It's like opening a portal to hell yeah. to get like one soul out. You, you can't leave that open. That's why the ARC mode is the one to go for because you're yeah. just getting the one person out and then you're leaving all the rest of the demons there. So theoretically, the only one you need to and probably want to turn on is the ARC in the Marantz. However, I have to warn you, there are some TVs where it won't work. It won't work unless control is also on. Right, right. So if it does, after we get through what to do in the Sony TV, if it doesn't work, then try turning on the HDMI control part and tr try turning the TV audio switching also on in the Marantz. It might be necessary. I don't know for sure with your exact TV. Now, in your Sony, uh, two places. You have to first press the home button and go to the settings under that. You have to go to the sound settings and make sure that your digital audio out is set to HDMI. Because by default, it's set to optical, and that might be your problem. So you have to make sure your digital audio out is set to HDMI. Then you have to go to the action menu, because they couldn't put it underneath settings. <laughs> it has to be in a separate action menu. And there you have to go to your speaker settings within your action menu and set those to external audio system, because otherwise it defaults to playing it out of the TV's built-in speakers. So two things, you have to say your digital audio is your HDMI, that's under your home and settings, and you have to say your audio system is an external audio system under your speakers under the action menu. Ah, the action menu. That's a well-known <laughs> menu that is in many other devices. Right. Like, often you will find things under the action menu. And it's right after the, uh, the, 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 the refrigerator menu. Right which is also how, how dark do you want your toast button? That's right. Yeah. That's uh, right. Finally, the bagel, the bagel switch. If it still awesome. doesn't work <laughs> after all of those things, and you might have to rewind to go through it all again. If it still doesn't work, there is one last thing, which is that under the settings menu, so home and settings on your Sony, you can go to the external input section, go to the Bravia sync settings because Bravia sync is their name for HDMI CEC. And you might have to turn Bravia sync control on possibly okay. i don't know hopefully not but maybe so three <sighs> things you might have to do in your sony three things you might have to do in your marantz i don't blame you for this not working right away ah. stupid <laughs> menus menus suck so uh how can you be sure his marantz is playing atmos the small porthole display only shows what which input he's using and the volume there's usually and i don't have a marantz but i have a denon it's yeah. same company these days there's usually an info button yes that you can hit and it'll show you what's coming in and what you know what speakers are being used on the way in yeah. what signal is coming in and then what speakers you're using on the way out yeah you know so that is the, the way to do button. it of course that doesn't help you if you aren't watching something on your television where the video is being sent through the marantz because it's an on-screen display right right so it only shows up on your television so if you 
uh, I don't. Would it work if he's watching an app on his TV, sending only the ARC back? I'm not sure. Yeah, if it, it should. Because well, the no, ARC because then be you're not you're down. you're not on the HDMI input where you would see the signal coming out of the Marantz at that point. You're seeing the video from the built-in app. So I think that's the problem, right? I think he's using the built-in app, sending the audio right. back via ARC. Therefore, he's not seeing the on-screen display if he presses info because he's not tuned to the HDMI input. Oh, that's true. Where the Marantz is. So, yeah. That's... Didn't Marantz used to have like a flip down thing where the, 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 the small the display? Only on the display. 70 series, the 7010 or the 7011 yeah. in his case. And he's got the 6011. So, the answer actually is the uh, the app. You could look this up in the uh, Marantz control app while things are okay. playing. That that would be the way to do it. Brandon. Brandon has a 5.2.4 setup using Golden Ear speakers. One of the big reasons he opted for Golden Ear is because his TV is above his fireplace and the slim SuperSat 60C center speakers, one of the few center speakers that would physically fit. He didn't actually audition anything else. He just went with Golden Ear from the jump. But since we've repeatedly mentioned that Golden Ear isn't aimed for strictly uh, isn't aiming for strict linearity and accuracy, he decided to finally audition something else. And the Perian's recent sale got him to order the Varus 2 Grand Towers and center. That center does not fit. I can tell you well, that right it's now. It's definitely taller. <laughs> <laughs> the towers sound amazing, but he doesn't like the large Varus 2 Grand Center at all so far. He says it sounds hollow, and the upper mids and treble are very bright. The towers don't sound that way at all, so he's wondering what could have gone wrong. The center is set up in front of the, in front of the fireplace mantle. There's a selector switch on the Varus 2 Grand Center for either shelf or cabinet placement, There were, but there was only a very slight change in sound between the two and nothing that helped the hollow, bright-sounding problem. What should he change? All right. So, so this is close to the center that you have, Tom. This is the, the updated yeah, yeah, version yeah. of it. but And it's definitely, I mean, a timbre matches really well with these, these yeah. speakers. So I, I, I have a hard time. It hasn't been your experience. Yeah. Hasn't been my experience at all. So I would, I mean, to me, this screams of a room or a placement yeah. interaction. You know, it could be that the the speaker itself is somehow damaged. I don't. I mean, I don't know how that right. that could be. But it sounds to me like you're getting some sort of bounce or uh, room interaction that's causing this. Yeah, I'm not so, sure what type of fireplace it is. Like most modern fireplaces are like basically have a solid front. But if it's an older fireplace where it actually has like depth to it, where you could put actual right. wood logs in there, it might be something to do with that. It's like literally ringing around in the hollow of the fireplace now that the right. speaker is, he says, below his mantle or in front of his mantle. So, so the sound could be getting into that hollow space of the fireplace itself. But I don't know if his fireplace is even that type. Yeah. So could, I mean, could I be super pedantic? You could be. Um, I mean, you're going to be. Just, just, so I guess I'm going to allow you to. I, I'm not saying this is what you did, but just to cover all bases, did you rerun your room correction? Is it possible you're using the same EQ that was being applied to the Golden Ear Center yeah, now on the Hyperion Center? That was my other thought was that if you To me, you that would explain the bright, the bright yeah. part of it. Yeah, it, honestly, doesn't often like boost those highs that much. Oh, but it, it can. does. It can. Yeah. It, it, depending on what was happening with your speaker before. So if you haven't re rerun Odyssey or whichever, did he say what receiver uh, he has? I don't recall which receiver yeah. he has, but whatever. If you ever rerun your, your EQ, you need yeah. to do that for sure. Uh, which you probably would, have, but just covering bases just yeah. in case, because it might explain it. Then I, what I would do is just physically move it. <laughs> you know, right. I would right. move it into the room and I would put like pillows on the ground or, you know, a big thick blanket on the ground in front of it and, you know, maybe all around it yeah. and see if that makes a difference. If yeah, because it's a moving sealed it the, design, yeah. so it's not like a port yeah. that's humming or something. Right. It is a bit odd. I mean, that, inherently, that's not the way the speaker sounds. So either it's the EQ thing, it's the placement thing, or you just have a defective unit, which is not yeah. utterly impossible. So, No, I mean, it happens. Yeah. So he asked, which voice setting, shelf or cabinet, would be the normal setting if it were a uh, center was just on a stand? Uh, I think you actually answered your own question when you said, I tried both, because <laughs> that's right. the correct setting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, I would try both no matter what. Like, I did have the same experience as you did, is when I switched the switch, mm -hmm. I was like, ah, I don't really notice anything. Yeah. So... I mean, I would put shelf yes. would be my normal. Yeah, because the cabinet is trying to compensate for some boundary uh, reinforcement, so it's actually knocking right. down the the upper mid or upper base a little bit, like the lower mid range. It's knocking that down a little bit in case you had actually recessed it into a cabinet, and we're getting right. a bunch of boundary reinforcement. So shelf is the normal setting. Yeah. So which center speakers do we, Rob, Tom and Rob, use? Well, I mean, right now I have the Varus Grand. 
uh, center, yeah. not the two, the the first one, the original, the OG. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have used oodles <laughs> of center channels. I've had center channels from RBH. I've had center channels from, uh, uh, let me see, Axiom. I've had center channels from, I've, I actually just literally tested out center channels from time mm -hmm. to time. So I have heard tons of different center channels. But I use the various ones. Yeah, I am using uh, Ascend Acoustics, their Horizon, uh, Sierra Horizon with the RAL ribbon tweeter upgrade. However, my particular Sierra Horizon is actually a custom cabinet that uh, David Fabricant made for me. It is wider and shallower than the regular Sierra Horizon. So that was uh, to give it uh, less depth front to back so that it would fit where I needed to fit. That's what I'm using. And you just heard a, a thing that you probably wish you would have heard before you started buying other stuff. You're like, wait, I can get this custom made? Mm. Yes, you can. It does cost more. Yes, it you does. You can get it custom made. Sushmet on Twitter, he asks, have we ever listened to any speakers that use an active digital crossover? If so, what were our impressions? My answer to that is, I think so. Because I have been to high-end audio shows before, mm -hmm. and I'm positive that something in there would have an active digital crossover. My reaction is I don't remember. And I, I'm, I'm sure I didn't like what I heard anyways because most of those speakers sucked. But um, an active digital crossover, I don't really think should sound any different than a passive crossover. I mean, that's the whole idea is that you're, it gives you the yeah, you flexibility to, to make... You should hear a crossover. Something's right. wrong if you can hear the crossover itself. The idea is that you can adjust the, you know, you, you, the active crossover is something that can be adjusted for each individual room. It's something that most people neither want nor need. So it, it's something that I, I don't know that has a huge market mm. out there. Yeah, I've heard some uh, Focal professional monitors that have yeah. uh, active digital crossover. And well, uh, if you ever heard of synthesis system, I guess you've heard active digital sure. crossovers too. So or uh, uh, the the, uh, the darts from Phase yep, Tech. I've heard those as well. So those are two more, and those sounded great. But yeah. I mean, those are professionally calibrated by <laughs> you know in, you know trained installers, so I'd expect them to sound good regardless of the crossover. So, so. yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I can't attribute <clears throat> anything I heard to the yeah. crossover, right? If if those Focal professional monitors that I heard had used a passive crossover instead. I've no doubt that Focal can make that passive crossover and make those speakers sound just as good. It's it's a dis design decision that they decided to go with with those particular monitors. Right. Uh, but the crossover itself, I'm not going to attribute good or bad to that. It's uh, it design it properly and either one should be able to work just fine. So for those of you that are not really familiar with what a crossover does, the mm -hmm. idea is that a driver has limitations. So, you know, it can, you can send a signal to any driver of any size, mm -hmm. of any sound frequency you would like to recreate. And that driver will try to yes. recreate that sound and it will have different levels of success. There is a sweet spot with the driver size and the weight and the materials and everything else that goes into it, the magnet size, everything, that there's a sweet spot where it operates very well mm -hmm. without distorting or changing its shape right. as it's trying Moves to push in It moves just like a piston out. the way that you want it to. So the crossover is designed so that you can take two or three or more different drivers and use them in conjunction where some of the frequencies are going to one driver but not to the other. Some of the frequencies are going to the other driver but not the first one. And there's some frequencies that are being sort of shared mm -hmm. at, which are being crossed over. That's where, the say, the driver is playing the high end it's, it's it's ability to, to recreate that sound well is starting to taper off. So you lower the volume there and you increase the volume on the other driver where it start, you know, it too is having problems, but maybe, you know, together they're able to boost each other's sounds loud enough so that you get the, uh, the right volume. And then that driver takes over lower that where it operates really well. Mm -hmm. That's what the crossover does. An active crossover is essentially a crossover that you can change on the fly. Or it's crossover. just one that's electrically powered with, sure. a, with a power cord. And yeah. like digital, of course, <laughs> means that it's it's doing it through digital signal processing. Right. Um, whereas a passive crossover is literally just made out of uh, capacitors, inductors, and resistors. Right. And So the know, idea the here is that the crossover is trying to get, you know have all the drivers play as in, in its sweet spot, its good area. So having an active crossover shouldn't sound any different than the passive crossover in operation because it's they're doing the exact same job right 
just in slightly yeah. different ways. Yeah, there's nothing inherently better about it, but it, I mean, it could sound different. Of course it could, but yeah, if you swap out some cool. of the components in a passive crossover, it will sound different too. Yeah. So he's going to try building some DIY bookshelf speakers, and he's considering using an active crossover instead of a regular passive crossover. In particular, KX Studio Links... Linux. 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 Oh, Linux. Linux. Software. Oh, sorry. Uh, software running on a Raspberry Pi. He's read some literature that suggests there are some things that active crossovers can do that passive can, crossovers cannot, particularly when it comes to phase alignment. Do we have any knowledge about this or any recommendations for going either passive or active with the, with the crossover design? Um, I don't really... I mean, I'm not an electrical engineer and I'm not a speaker designer and I've never claimed to be. So I am not really familiar with, you know, why we would... you would go you know, with the fate you know different things the active crossover i'm sure active crossovers can do things that passive crossovers cannot especially if you're using dsp uh or digital signal processing that being said uh there's a reason why passive crossovers have been used for so long and that's mostly because uh you know once you design it you know w once you design a good crossover for your speaker it it's not really going to change so mm -hmm. using an active solution is a lot more expense then you really need you design that passive crossover and it works for every single speaker that you're if they, if they, if they all have the same spec yeah, if you're mass producing it it totally makes sense producing. but you on the other hand are trying to diy your own speaker yeah. i would definitely go with the pass an active crossover oh, yeah because you have the ability to make mistakes yeah. and then fix them without having to go back to scratch and design so a much easier crossover. to do your trial yeah. and error when you have an active digital crossover i am super in favor of you using the active digital crossover when it's a yeah. diy project uh so the the other uh, i don't know quirk it's not really a plus or a minus some people consider it a minus is that when you're using a digital active crossover of course the amplification has to come after the crossover not before it so right. you have to have the output from the digital crossover turned into analog and then sent ampli amplification, which means you need a separate amplifier for each driver or right. each set of drivers that's getting that signal from the output end of the crossover. So it's a slightly different design. It does mean you probably need more amplifier channels. A, a passive uh, crossover, you can have one amplifier before the crossover and it sends all the power through the crossover, which then you know divides it up and sends it out to each driver. So that's why a lot of you know mass market speakers, you only have the one set of binding posts, one amplifier powering it, whereas active digital, you'd ha you usually have the amplifiers are built into the speaker itself and there'll be one for each driver. Yeah. Lastly, he asks, what are our thoughts on the claim often attributed to Floyd Tool that we should not absorb sidewall reflections? Sushmit squeaked out an extra $400 in his budget, so he's wondering if it would be more beneficial to put that money towards room treatments on his side and front walls or on his ceiling. Mm. Um, well, sidewalls are the first reflection point. So, uh, right. yes, okay. We've come across this before, and... Uh, it sort of kind of depends on your room. You know, really big opinion, rooms, yeah. you know, that Floyd Tool is dealing with. He's like, you don't need to absorb those side reflections. You're like, yeah, the wall's like a bajillion feet away from <laughs> the speaker. No, that first reflection point is only hitting the dude in the back of the room. And he's got 30 people it's going through before it gets to him. So, no, you don't have to absorb it. But in m many rooms, and honestly, if you're going to buy the, the, uh, the absorption panels, try it. You know, sure just right put, <laughs> right just yeah. lean it up against the wall right there and that's just true. say does this make a difference that's to true. me put it in all the places that you want to put it and then say okay before you put any nails in your wall or whatever you're going to use to hang it but uh our experience and my experience has been that those first reflection points are very important because that first reflection gets back to you just a little bit behind the direct yeah. speaker sound and messes up your can, can affect the imaging of your speakers mm -hmm. so i mean i i think that that it, he's not wrong but he's not talking to you <laughs> he's talking <laughs> to somebody else yeah i'm more in line with uh kevin vakes's uh opinions on this uh kevin vakes is the guy who runs uh revel and revel is part of Harmon as well um and so his his basic stance on it and i'm paraphrasing so if i get it a little bit wrong forgive me but more or less the smaller the room the more he's in favor of absorbing the first reflection points and the larger the room the less necessary it is and i'm very yeah. much in line with that opinion as well and it makes sense it's you know when you've got a smaller room those reflections are coming really quickly after the direct sound which means 
means your brain just sums them together and it's like well, that's that's one continuous sound the farther if the walls are quite far away your brain can actually differentiate between the direct and the reflected sound and your brain does a really good job at that and floyd's like when that's the case you don't really need those side wall reflections gone in fact when they are gone your brain thinks something is a little bit askew so right. both are correct in my opinion but i think it depends on your room size alongo as desktop alongo uses an audio quest dragonfly dac plus uh, is that what is a DAC plus? Oh no, or a DAC, DAC plus and a... headphone amplifiers. Okay, okay but DAC and a he headphone amplifier to power his Audio Technica M50X headphones. Well, excuse me, I like those. Mm -hmm. He mostly listens to Spotify. By default, his window sets this output, his audio output to, to the Dragonfly to be 24 bit, 96 kilohertz. Spotify definitely isn't streaming 24 bit, <laughs> 96 kilohertz audio. Ain't that the truth, Haas? So, is there any negative impact to, by using this default setting? Would things sound better if you manually set the output to a bit rate and sampling frequency that match the streaming source? All right, I can understand where this question is coming from for sure, because as an audio purist, many times you and yeah, not audio purist, but many times you and I have talked about about how up converting or up sampling things is a pointless endeavor and there's <laughs> no point to it. In this case, it is a pointless endeavor that is doing absolutely no harm to your signal. You, there, there would be, I cannot imagine a scenario where a DAC inside of a computer would be so bad as it as it up samples from whatever well, it's doing from Spotify. Well, it isn't even a DAC. It's not converting it to analog at all. It's well, that's true. Yeah, it's yeah. just sending that. It's, sending, it's digitally. Yeah. It's digitally up sampling it, I yeah. guess. You know? So it's really not. I mean, this is just, it's literally like multiplying. Yes. It can't mess it up. <laughs> it's a computer. Yeah. It's what it does. I mean, it defaults to that because that's what the Dragonfly can accept. So yeah. Windows is just like, all right, I'm going to send you what you can accept. Now, of course, the Dragonfly could accept 44.1 kilohertz, 16-bit, um, which is pretty much what's being sent from Spotify. But uh, yeah, I mean, again, you can try it. It's not going to hurt anything if you just manually switch it and give it a listen, but I wouldn't anticipate any difference whatsoever. <laughs> right. And certainly no harm in sending 24-bit, 96 kilohertz. I 100% uh, agree. Yeah, so... On my so the gaming computer that we got, and my son's uh, is finally starting the game on it. Mm -hmm. he's, they, now my two boys are fighting over it because one course. wants to play Fortnite and one wants to play Overwatch, and I don't really care because I don't play games anymore because they don't have any time. But they, uh, they we have you know, there's a headphone jack on the thing, so I've mm -hmm. been I was using the headphone jack with my bigger uh, Oppos though PM twos, and then I I was like you know I've got that that stealth dc1 or right. whatever it was from, from Emotiva. Emotiva. i'm gonna hook that up now there's an instance where it sounded a lot better coming oh yeah Emotiva. he's got way because... more amplifier power for the headphones coming up right and the Emotiva. headphones i mean i don't i mean i can power them with my phone all mm -hmm. right but the difference in like the ability to recreate the sound correctly mm -hmm. made a huge difference now was that because it's you know the 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 emotiva is taking that and up sampling it as well or somebody somewhere down the line is up sampling seriously it says, doubt it's actually anything to do with the digital to analog conversion yeah I mean, that, it, it, it's just the power what you're saying is exactly why whenever we say that DACs don't make a huge difference everyone is like what are you talking about you're crazy i plugged in a DAC to my computer and it made a huge difference but i'm like right it was the amplification that made yes. a huge difference or the lower noise that made right. a huge difference because the headphone jack that's just built into the front of your computer is probably noisy and probably really underpowered Yes, and those two things is. make way more difference than the digital to analog conversion part of the signal change. So again, misattribution is what usually happens yeah. there. All right, Luke on Twitter. Luke is preparing for a long flight. Well, he's probably, sorry, dude. <laughs> probably <laughs> too late. Answered yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> I answered him on Twitter, so he got some yeah. kind of response. He's wondering if you should invest in some noise-canceling headphones. He already has a pair of Shure in-ear monitors. So what would be the benefits of active noise-canceling headphones versus the passive isol uh, isolation of in-ear monitors? Right. So using noise-canceling headphones is great for drowning out the droning of the of the plane. Yeah, the you know, engine sound. That's the a engine constant, sound, that, that constant sort of... humming drone. And even like um, general crowd noise yeah. of people chattering, which is pretty As long as it's, sort of, it's close to white. The closer it is to white yeah. noise, the better it is at doing it. Now, what's the downside? The downside is that you usually take power to make that work, mm -hmm. which can be an issue depending on which ones you buy. Uh, they are basically pumping sound into your ears. Mm -hmm. That is the, the cancellation wave. So you're it, it's sounding quieter, but you're you're 
there's still a lot of pr more pr there's not a lot of, there's more pressure on your ears i find them you know after a while of wearing them and my ears hurt mm. <laughs> if that makes sense um but it's not gonna it's not gonna either you're gonna hear crying babies mm -hmm. you're gonna hear the lady talking to you next to you, yeah, the you individual know, voices yeah the, all that stuff is still coming through oh yeah like i thought the first time i tried no, uh, active noise canceling headphones i was gonna put them on and my kids were gonna uh, just mm. be their mouths were just gonna move and i wasn't gonna be able to hear them <laughs> it's not the case now to me i don't i find that I, just regular isolation from headphones is usually good enough for me it's close enough you know with the music on it's fine Yep. Uh, but if if that droning noise really bothers you, then that, that would be the benefit. I guess I'm super in favor of passive isolation, the sure inner monitors that I'm a big fan of. They have multiple different ear tips. Make sure you're right. using the ones that Foam. fit you properly and give you a really good seal. And remember that your left ear might have a different size opening than your right ear. You don't have to use the same size for both ears. It's fine to use different sizes if your ears happen to take that. Um, yeah, the foam ones, the comply fit ones, uh, sort of uh, orangey or yellowy tip on them with the, the foamy thing, those seal really, really well. They work very much like you know, just regular ear plugs. And I'm super in favor of those because you don't have the, the extra pressure. You're not worrying about a battery running out. And uh, if you put it just even quiet music on, the world is gone. So, yeah. Yeah. So he'd like to be untethered from his phone. So he's wondering about Bluetooth options. He'd be okay with a wire running between the two earphones as long as there's no more wire running from the earphones to, to his phone. He has Shure in-ear monitors and Shure offers a Bluetooth cable that can replace the standard cable, but at $80 seems kind of pricey. Is there a better value option? Uh, I'm sure there, there are lots of Bluetooth headphones out there that either do or do not have uh, headphone um I mean, a active noise cancellation. There's a whole bunch of the that, that are like clones of each other. The J something or others. I can't remember what they're called. Mm. But um, honestly, f for eighty bucks, you're probably going to spend most of eighty bucks on another set of headphones that do all the things you want them to do in Bluetooth. Uh, you can spend a lot more if you aren't careful. So eighty dollars might just be the way I would probably go if you know you like the headphones and you know they fit you. And you know you like their sound. To me, that's probably your best option. But I'm sure Rob's got a suggestion. Um, yeah, I mean, if if you just want to keep the ones that you have, but just replace their cable, then yeah, you might pony up the money, get that sure cable that turns them into that. Uh, there's a couple of alternatives though. Um, one, you could just get entirely new in-ear monitors, uh, RBHs, uh, EPSBs are good sounding uh, little Bluetooth uh, ones. They have a little cord that goes between your left ear and right ear, but that's the only cord. Nothing actually going from them to your phone. And they have a phone tip, a foam tip too, right? So yep, that, that would tips be, on those. That would be quite isolation. And, uh, and they are uh, 70 bucks right now on sale. They're not normally that cheap. Ten dollars, <laughs> but uh, seventy bucks. So yeah, but you know, who knows? Maybe that that's one way to do it. The other thing you could do is uh, a van tree does have a good little um, what do they call it? The Clipper Pro. And it's a little Bluetooth adapter. So you would take the regular headphone cable that you're already using, but you'd plug it into the little Clipper Pro instead of directly into your phone. And then the Clipper Pro is connected via Bluetooth to your phone. So you still have the regular cable. It's still dangling down from your head, but you can be untethered from your phone, which is the thing that he said he wanted to be. <laughs> so I'm not seems, sure. Seems, seems kind of kind of complicated i guess well i mean <laughs> you're just plugging it into an alternate thing right that's right i mean if you're gonna plug into that you might as well plug it into your phone I don't know. kind of yeah although you know i don't know maybe your phone's gonna be in your backpack and this lets you undo that so uh, you can find mm -hmm. those for uh certainly 35 dollars usually about 30 bucks you can find those for so that that's an alternative way to change one thing to another so he noticed that the Focal Little Bird has a stated uh, minus 3 dB frequency response down to 89 hertz. So it seemed like you'd want to cross over frequency higher than regular 80 hertz, correct? Uh, probably. Yeah, probably. But, but it depends on your room and your placement and everything else. So he asked, would that mean the subwoofer playing higher than 80 hertz would start to sound directional? And what's the nature of the relationship between sound directionality and frequency? And how does that impact the subwoofer to speaker crossover all right so there's a couple of things there's a couple of things part of these questions okay first of all it's not like there's a brick wall at 80 right. hertz you can you know exactly where it's coming from at 79 you're like it's everywhere no that's not <laughs> how it works all right there it is a continuum 
okay it's a continuum so it, at 80 hertz you're more likely to notice where the, the directionality is the higher frequency you go the more right. you're able to locate that now Let's talk about a couple of things that can that can impact this. How close are you to the subwoofer? How close is the subwoofer to the directionality of where the sound was supposed to be coming from? Anyways, meaning if if you're worried about these surrounds or maybe these are surround backs and the subwoofer is at the back of the room, well then directionality is less of an issue. But on top of that, two subwoofers reduces directionality considerably because they're both mm -hmm. playing the same thing from two different directions, which means your brain goes ass ah, everywhere. So. <laughs> You, we can f fix directionality, you know, and, and by the way, 10 hertz, is not, it's going to, it's going to probably cross over at 90 or 90 or hundred. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not going to be enough. So you'll be like, it's there. Right. Now, if you're sitting directly next to the subwoofer, it's being crossed over much higher, like at 120 hertz, like you would with those little tiny sats that they, we used to use little cubes mm -hmm. everywhere. And it's the subwoofer right next to you. You're like, it's playing. I can tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course you can tell. You're sitting right next to the stupid thing but guy can't take a guarantee you put another one in the room and put them f you know a little bit further away from you you're gonna have a much harder time even at as high as 120 hertz yeah on the uh sort of human front of it uh, mostly we determine directionality of sound by the interaural difference meaning the differences that are happening to your left ear versus your right ear and those can be timing differences those can be volume differences or they can be uh the result of reflections including the reflections off of your own head and your shoulders as well as the reflections around you and when your left ear gets a different signal than your right ear uh, we use that to locate where the sound came from so just in terms of wavelength what we can detect as an interaural difference purely on wavelength uh we have to be about a about a quarter of the wavelength and the average human head is wide enough that somewhere between 300 and 400 hertz is where we can 100% tell where that sound came from based on just our left ear getting a different signal in time versus the right ear from that one wavelength. The time it took to travel from the distance between the two ears is enough that we can use right. that to locate the sound. Now, when you go down to one eighth of the wavelength, so down at 150 to 200 hertz, we have a heck of a time telling where that came from. It's very, very difficult for us. There are a few little things in reflections off of our shoulders and stuff that we can kind of use and get a sense of it's maybe that way versus that way, you know, very vague. Um, but we have a heck of a time telling and then another octave below that, so 75 to 100 hertz, we essentially can't tell at all. So that 80 hertz was chosen because we essentially can't tell at all at yeah. that point. And you're talking it's about... It's basically guaranteed. Yeah. Like everybody who says, oh, I can totally tell at 80 hertz is a liar. <laughs> <laughs> or they're, they're kidding themselves. But so. the other part of it is there are still harmonics being played. Yeah. And the harmonics yeah. uh, in a subwoofer crossover, so we talked about crossovers previously, but in a subwoofer crossover, uh, an octave above wherever you set the crossover, it's 24 decibels quieter assuming you're using a, a fourth order uh, crossover. So uh, 24 decibels per octave. So up at uh, 150, 200 hertz, you're about 24 decibels quieter. And then another octave above that, you're about 48 decibels quieter. That's not silence. And you might still be able to pick that up. But the point is usually your speakers are playing much more loud, much more, uh, you know, higher volume than your subwoofers right. at those frequencies. So you locate your speakers playing those sounds, not your subwoofer. So the higher you set the crossover, the more chance you'll hear some of those harmonics coming from your subwoofer as well. But interaural differences down at 75 to 100 hertz, we really can't tell. These speakers can be crossed at 100 hertz. It's really no problem. Yeah. So he says his den receiver auto set some of his speakers to large, but when he went to manually change them to small, like we always recommend, he noticed that he still had the option to assign a crossover frequency even to the speakers that were set as large. Why is that? How would that work? Really? <laughs> you do in, the, in the modern den and Amarances, they let you do I, this. I, I, I guess I had never noticed that because I always immediately set them to... to uh, small but yep. the reality is is large speakers don't play down to 20 hertz so <laughs> offering a crossover is a good idea regardless whether or not they're large or it's small. not really what it's doing though it's still sending the full range signal to any speakers that are set to large so in a yeah. den and a Marantz, any speakers that you have set to large are getting the full range signal they're attempting to play all the way down to 20 hertz or even lower they give you the crossover because under the subwoofer output setting there are the two options, LFE or LFE plus oh, mains. Right, 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 right. And if you set the subwoofer output to just LFE, it'll actually tell you in text, uh, now the subwoofer output will be the LFE channel, that makes sense, and the bass coming from any speakers that have been set too small. But that's it. 
So speakers mm. that are set to small, it's getting their bass, and the dedicated LFE channel, of course, it's getting that bass. But if you set the subwoofer output to the LFE plus mains setting, then it will take the bass from any speaker that has a crossover applied to it, including speakers that have been set to large. So the speaker is attempting to play all the way to down to 20 hertz, and it is duplicating that bass out of the subwoofer output below whatever crossover frequency you set. So it's attempting to duplicate the bass out of two places. Ah. Well, again, it's clear as mud, these receiver settings. I know, right? It's just it's just like, hey, that's actually a pretty good idea. Oh, that's not what we did. <laughs> what? Wait, what? No, no, <laughs> no. Why would we do that? Well, because you're actually protecting the speaker if you do a crossover, even if it's a large speaker. Oh, no. Now, the thing no. is, if you, if you had, like crazy speakers that actually really can play down to 20 hertz sure and you have your front left and your front right and you've set those to large and then you put two subwoofers at the back of the room mirroring their placement sure. in a rectangular yeah. room you could actually use that and you in effect have four subwoofers now that's yeah. it's not out of the question to do that well i mean it's out of the question for lee to do it because his his <sighs> won't actually reach down to 20 that's and right. he doesn't have any subwoofers but at I all. But I said, if you have the crazy speakers that really can. Yeah. You know, like Gene at Audioholics, this is what he does. Say, he sets his speakers to large, and they genuinely are. They Those really can. But then he also has... They are physically large. They're like like That's 300 cool. pounds oh, a piece. Huge. And then he has <laughs> he has five subwoofers in addition to those. So, you know, lots of subs. Got a couple of subs. Yeah. He's got subs to spare. I wonder if he put all his subs in, up in his... In his... Uh, bathroom on the counter on oh the left to <laughs> during go the, to, during, the to, to, during the hurricane i did because i care about my subs <laughs> all right infinite gary gary has the the two disc dvd release of pearl harbor why mm. why do you have that movie it's so bad <laughs> um it's a thx certified dvd his lexicon pre-pro is a thx certified and sure enough it's manual recommends using thx listening modes with re-eq re to s simulate the high frequency roll-off that occurs in movie theaters since the film mix might be too bright in home theaters it says He's that never... right in quotes it's right yep. there in the manual he never used the THX listening mode before, but he also never thought it sounded too bright. We brought all of this THX re-EQ stuff up that last week. Well, not last he, has week, he, before that. No, whatever. <laughs> he has he been doing it wrong all this time. <laughs> uh, okay, first of all, you answered your own question by saying it never sounded too bright That's to right. you. So the answer to the question is you were doing it right. If you were, you know, and honestly, dude, just ignore all this THX stuff. <laughs> just ignore it. <laughs> Just ignore it. I've never but I, I've ever noticed... watched a THX movie and thought, you know what's really wrong with this? Is that it's really too bright. I've always thought, I'm so glad they put this much bass in here. <laughs> That's I, what I've, I've, I've noticed the opposite, which is using the THX listening mode without oh, yeah. having manually turn re-EQ off and going, there's some detail missing in this yeah. thing. And then you turn the re-EQ off and your treble comes back. So I've noticed the opposite of this. Um, yeah, There's no right or wrong, Gary. I mean, there, you're not mandated to use the THX right. listening mode. Uh, I suppose if you... I don't know. Is it worth giving a try? And uh, I don't know. He, he's, got, he's already tried it. Of course you can. And you can manually it. toggle re-EQ on and off. So pick whichever one you prefer because there's no right or wrong answer. He asked, how bad is it really to have a digital coax audio cable running next to a power cord? <coughs> Excuse Again, me. That is three weeks for three I weeks. I am telling huh? you, I have no idea what's going on. I, 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 I It's this weird sneezing thing I have going on in this podcast. I, I, okay, that's not true. I did sneeze today. I sneezed like 30 times in a row. I sneezed my okay. head off. But then I have not sneezed since the last time I was on this podcast, I swear. All right. How bad is it really to have a digital coax audio cable running next to a power cord? All right. Do you have like the world's cheapest, crappiest cables, Gary? Right. No? then you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. Like anytime we've ever had to deal with this problem, and I'll be honest with you, this is a problem that I have never seen manifest in real life. I, my cable management is atrocious. I just throw that crap back there, right? And if I have extra <laughs> cable, it just gets wound on top of itself and the power cables are all higgly piggly back there. I don't pay attention to none of that. And I've never, <laughs> ever experienced a problem. And I have, I have, and I'm not gonna lie. I have taken like the three cables you get when you buy a mm -hmm. CD player a million years ago, or our, our our VHS player. I've taken the the yellow one off, right? Because it has more shielding, and I've used those. Still, never noticed a problem. Yep. So this is sort of a 
it's not an old wives tale that's not what it is what it is is a it's like the 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 thing that your mom always says that you should do <laughs> like don't go swimming because you might get cramps it's like yeah you might if you go swimming at before you know after eating Mm-hmm. You know, don't wait 30 minutes. But the reality is no one has ever gotten cramps that way that anybody knows. You've never met a pe- person who dove in the water after you know, after taking a bite of a hamburger, immediately seized up and had to be dragged out of the water and saved by a lifeguard. It's never happened in your lifetime. It's not going to happen in your lifetime. And it's this is just a non-issue. Right. Yeah. That's what the shield on a coaxial cable is for. And on a digital signal cable, it's even less of a concern because digital is only concerned with is the signal high or low. It's, it's a square right. wave going through there. So uh, it's even less of a concern. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, he he found out that, you know, his he can wind it up through his the base of his speaker stand anyway. So wound up separating it anyway. And uh, Gary actually <laughs> did uh, <laughs> send a picture of the left side of his room. So he's got a closet door. That's why he couldn't put an acoustic panel on the left side. So that uh, mystery okay. is solved. Mystery uh, but yeah, solved. Uh, by and large, as long as you're using a coaxial cable that is properly constructed and has a shield, it's a close to a non-issue. Yeah. All right. Gary noticed that on his Morantz SACD player, if he plays an SACD, the front panel will display uh, the front panel display of the player shows the track tile along with the track number and time. But with regular CDs, it only shows the track number and the time, and not the track title. Why is that the case? If he plays a CD on his Oppo 203, its front panel only shows the time. But if he turns on the TV, the TV display has all sorts of information. Artists, album name, track title, even the cover art. So if all this info is present, why can't the front panel display just show the name of the track that's... (laughs) Why can't the front panel display show the name of the track that's playing? Because... Someone didn't think you'd want it there. And that's why they did it. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a programming you know, thing. I, I'm not sure on CDs. I mean, CD to CD, I'm sure the metadata can be different because these type of things, yeah. track title, that is is metadata. Yeah, and that's all on it is. Yeah. Regular Redbook CDs, I'm not sure if they include that all the time in every release. Some might, some might it, not. I, would, I think, yeah, it would very much depend on the publisher and yeah. you know, maybe which uh, pressing you now got. The you know, Opo if you get the, for things Kids like Kids Bop uh, 17. Yeah. You know, they, they probably, they may include a lot of information or none at all. Who knows? For the Opal, for things like cover art, I think it's actually connecting to a service probably and downloading is. that because I don't think yeah. that's that's not usually on the CD, the cover art. It's not. So I'm sure yeah. it's connecting to, uh, what is it, like Grace Note or something like that. It's yeah. probably what that Opal is doing for the on-screen display. But yeah, as far as why the Marantz does that for SACDs and not CDs, SACDs definitely have all that metadata. Uh, the CDs, it, it, some of them probably do, but some of them don't. So they're probably like, yeah, lowest common denominator. The ones that don't, doesn't do it. And the ones that do, we don't do it for that either. <laughs> yeah. That way we'll get people calling us saying, how come yeah, this, how come this one did on and this? this one didn't? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes you're just like, okay, <laughs> what's going to, like, how many people can we fire from the customer service department if we don't have our product right. do this thing? Um, so he says when using his Roku, Roku Ultra to stream from Amazon. He's getting a lip sync problem. Yeah. Welcome to my world, dude. Yeah. Amazon and lip sync and me do not get along. I had to stop watching Mr. Robot because the lip sync just mm. so bad. It really? Was oh, that's nuts. Such a good show. Yeah. Uh, he has a Roku. He has the Roku Ultra plugged into his Anthem processor, which then feeds his projector. Uh, projector does not any help in this situation, and the audio is ahead of the video. He tried using Anthem's lip sync setting to delay the audio, but it only goes to one seventy uh, milliseconds or whatever MS mm-hmm. is, which apparently isn't enough. Any chance that using the Roku Ultra's optical audio output and plugging the HDMI directly into projector for video would improve things? Uh, any chance of a different streaming ser- device for Amazon Prime vid- Video would deliver better results or offer sync adjustments of its own. I, like I tell you, dude, I I fixed it for, and it was it was way more than 170 mm-hmm. to, for me and uh, Amazon. I fixed it, and then I, I had to unfix it so that I, everything else wasn't screwed up. Right, I right, mean, right. everything was messed up. So uh, I, I feel you. Yeah. I feel you. Uh, I don't have a good solution for you. The I would try if you if you can to to plug the video directly into the projector. Yeah. To see if that makes a difference. Usually, what the anthem is doing is inside of the anthem, it's synchronizing it so that 
sending it out to the out to the uh, projector or sending it out to the display. It doesn't know what it's connected to. Sending it out to the display and, and playing the audio itself, those are in sync. But then your projector is probably adding some extra delay from whatever processing it has to do. Right. So there's a chance that if you just plug the video separate from the audio, um, then the Anthem at least isn't going to be delaying the video at all, right? And then maybe it'll have enough range. I, I've seen a lot of modern receivers that give you at least 250 milliseconds. Um, yeah. But yeah, ah, oh, God, is there a better solution? I mean, is there a, a different, I guess you could try a Fire TV. I mean, that's Amazon's own device. If anything's going to do Amazon streaming well, it'll be a Fire TV. You would hope, uh, or a Fire Stick, at the yeah. very least. I mean, that'd be cheaper. Um, there's not much else that can be done here. There's really not much else. Yeah. There, I mean, there's professional video processing, you know, I guess standalone units. <laughs> that maybe could do this. But, oh, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I guess but so, even yeah. then, it would fix it for Amazon. But the minute you switch to a different app, you'd, yeah. be, you'd be screwed again. Yeah. So uh, it, it's this, there's no real lip sync is is like the to me the, like my worst nightmare. Yep. I know that sounds very petty and stupid. <laughs> I've got three kids that could get run over by a car, and Rob apparently could burn alive. But lip sync haven't yet. That's I'm the real right. problem. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Earl. Earl has some speaker wire that is meant for bio wiring. It has a single pair of red and black connectors on one end, but two pairs of black and red connectors on the other ends. All the ends are pre-terminated with banana plugs. He's changing speakers, and his new speakers only have one pair of binding posts. So what's the best way to connect things? Buy new speaker wire. It's cheap. <laughs> he doesn't want to because the ones that he has were expensive. And he's like, I've got these expensive speaker wires. I want to okay, use so them. Okay, so this is, I understand what you're saying, dude, yes. but for real change your speaker wire because i mean it, it's either the real solution in my mind is to strip the two ends and uh, put them together yes. and then put them into one pair of binding posts sure all right but now you're you those, those fancy the, pre-terminations that you bought yeah you could sell these things online and then buy cheap speaker wire which is what all you really need and then pocket the difference. Yeah. Because somebody is going to want these. Yeah. For I'm in, sure. I'm in favor of that. I mean, what will function is you could just make sure that one pair, one black and red pair of the side that has two pairs uh, is uh, not in contact with anything and definitely not in contact with each other. Maybe you wrap them with some electrical tape to make oh, sure. Geez. And then you, you see, just plug one I'm... in because it'll function. You just plug one pair of the yeah, yeah. It, It'll work. It'll function. And you just, just... want to make sure you get no short circuit. You short the, you short it and you got a chance of you know blowing an amplifier channel. I mean I these days are pretty they're pretty protected, but still, I mean why go through the all so <laughs> that you can use this fancy speaker wire that you're like no sell it. But if you just if you're bound and determined to use it and you just want it to function, then yeah, you make sure that the second pair is not ever going to come in contact with anything, and uh, you just plug one of them in. It'll work. It'll work just fine. Uh, I wouldn't chance it, man. But that's all just right. me, Josh. Josh was reading through one of the featured home theater uh, articles on SVS's website. A fellow named Jeff was detailing a setup in which he's using a new Denon X8500H receiver and a whole bunch of SVS speakers, 17 to be mm -hmm. precise. That does include the subwoofer, so don't go crazy. No, it doesn't. So, yeah, it does. No, it 17 plus dual subwoofers, so 19 I thought sound that producing it was things. 15 plus dual subwoofers. Nope, it's 17 plus uh, dual subwoofers. He said there's 19 including the subwoofers, so 17 speakers. All right, whatever. Setup includes seven four level uh, floor level channels, the traditional left, center, right, side surrounds, and surround backs. But what caught Josh's attention is that Jeff is using 10 SVS prime elevation speakers, so Josh wants to know how. Is there a way to use 10 overhead speakers for Atmos? The 8500H only includes four pair of height binding posts. How would Jeff be connecting 10 overhead speakers? The dude isn't. Read the article more carefully. He says that he is he's got them all up there, in hopes that someday he will be able to use them all. Right. And right now he can tr switch between the ones and try out different configurations to see what he likes. Yep. So he is not using them all. He is using the four overheads or six or whatever the 8500 yeah. can do. And that's it. Yeah, so six, six can be active. So he's got uh, front heights, top middles, and rear heights. So for mm. Atmos, that's what he'd be using. Uh, when he's listening to DTS-X, he can actually only have four of the overhead speakers active. So he's probably using the front heights and rear heights. That's what DTS would recommend. But he has also installed the, uh, okay, center height and top surround, AKA Voice of God. So those are for Oro 3D. 
Now, you can have those physically connected to the X8500H because the X8500H has eight height outputs, but only six of them can be active at any given time. So you can physically connect those and then it will switch. So a quote unquote normal person, this is still very rare, but a quote unquote normal person would have front heights, rear heights, uh, top middles, and then the front, uh, uh, the center height and the top surround all physically connected. And then the X8500H will automatically switch between using the top middles when it's Atmos and then the voice of God and the center height when it's Oro 3D. And both right. systems will use the front heights and the rear heights. But Jeff has also installed <laughs> surround height speakers, which are only used by Oro 3D. So right. there's really no way that he could have those physically connected at the same time. He would have to disconnect his top middles and then connect his surround heights. And then Oro could be set up to use front heights, surround heights, voice of God, and center height. But he would then have to use the Odyssey editor app to load different configurations. Right. Because right. that is changing the configuration. You can't just say, now I'm using surround heights instead of top middles and leave everything else the same. No, you have to wholesale swap the entire thing. So... Right now, he isn't actually doing that. He's installed them all ahead of time, hoping that, uh, maybe, who knows, maybe he wins the lottery and he buys a Trinov Altitude 32, and then he really could use all of these speakers. Mm. Nick. Nick says that most of his viewing now comes from streaming services, Netflix, Amazon, HBO, PBS, and some others. PBS has a streaming service? Oh, yeah. Is that, does it cost money? I don't know. I doubt it. Who knows? I, I, I will have to download that app. Yeah. He's got a Roku 3 and a non-4K Apple TV. It doesn't matter which streaming service or which device he uses. He sees banding in dark images. He still rents the odd Blu-ray disc now and then. How does he get that into his Roku? And those do not <laughs> show banding in dark images. So he doesn't think the problem is inherent to his TV. So what's the fix here? Would a newer device like a Apple uh, TV 4K deliver less banding? Will it get better? When he eventually upgrades his TV to OLED, OLED sometime in the next year, um, this there's a couple of things that could be going on here. Uh, the input that you're using for the streaming service is certainly different than the input you're using for the Blu-ray Blu service player? because you okay. cannot have, you're not using that. So there could be, and I'm not saying there is, there could be an issue with uh, settings as far as brightness is going. You could have some something going on there with the calibration on that one setting. More likely, this is a bandwidth issue in my mind. You are getting lower throughput from your streaming services, so there is banding and blooming and you know, micro blocking and other things that can be coming up because there's just compression that has to happen as it comes through the inner tubes into your house. Yeah. So what is your speed and that sort of thing? I suppose. Yeah. I mean, when I was watching Amazon Prime streaming through the built-in app on my LG OLED, I was definitely seeing banding. Yeah. Uh, no question. Uh, to me, the banding was more noticeable on Amazon Prime than it was on Netflix, and they do use slightly different compression and whatnot. Uh, right. But I'm pretty sure this is just a just a data compression thing. I mean, like you said, when you watch the Blu-ray, you're not seeing it, so it doesn't seem to be inherent to the television itself. Yeah. Um, That's the big giveaway right there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this... I mean, now he's saying it's, this, it's kind of the same no matter which streaming service he's using. So, like I say, I noticed a difference between Netflix and Amazon, but on Netflix, I did still see banding sometimes. It wasn't yeah. free from it all the time time so uh yeah it, it's kind of inherent to the source it's one of the reason why uh disc fans are still fans of discs because you don't yeah they just announced that they're gonna start you can now stream the infinity war movie yes i think yeah i think it started this week yeah and, and iTunes. i'm like yep. i can't wait till it comes out on disc so i can buy it yeah it's a that's how i'm gonna weeks watch away it. from disc i think but yeah. uh yeah so will it get better if he gets an oled or will it get better if he gets an apple tv 4k uh no. <laughs> uh, no. Talk, talk to your ISP, see if you can get some more mm. three, throughput. But even, but even then, I mean, I've got really then. fast internet and everything in Amazon Prime was still banding all over the place. It's yeah, just, that's uh, just the signal they're sending. The compression, there's going to be the compression. So there is yeah. compression that's going to happen. It's not like you can get like lossless no. video and audio from Netflix. It, they don't offer it. So I'm with you, right? Like I've noticed that, that there's a lot of video issues with Netflix and the other services uh, that I don't notice with my discs. Mm -hmm. And the convenience of the streaming is yeah. just too much. Yep. So 
So Sony has been lauded for their video processing that reduces banding. He isn't going to replace his TV right away for the, just for this banding issue. But when the time arrives, would there, there, this be enough of a reason to consider a Sony? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Maybe with the X1 Ultimate, if you want to spend seven thousand dollars. I mean, you get the um, Netflix. The, then your Netflix looks okay, but everything else looks like garbage. I mean, I don't know. I, honestly, <laughs> I don't. I, I I would be surprised if you would if this issue was uh, alleviated completely by buying a new TV. Oh, it won't be eliminated completely. But the the Sony's do a good job. They have a, a sort of a anti posterization and anti banding uh, processing that is part of it. It has been lauded. LG though has in their in their current models, so like the C8 and the E8 and those, the ones that ended in eight, um, they have also introduced an anti-banding thing. They've hidden it because they're LG and they like to hide things in their menus. They <laughs> hid it. They've hidden it under their MPEG noise reduction. If you set oh. that too low, it will activate the anti-banding. I don't know why they had to hide it in an existing setting, but there it is under the MPEG noise reduction. You set that to low, and it does. Uh, most people have said not quite as good as Sony, but very, very close. Uh, so it still won't eliminate it entirely. Uh, on Amazon, you'll still have some banding because it's coming from the source. But uh, yeah, it, yeah, you don't, you're not, you're not beholden to Sony. Uh, LG can do it too. Uh, well, well, hey, I, if you really like a Sony, Sony makes nice OLEDs, so I got no yeah, problem with no that. No doubt about that. I guess you know. I, I don't want to set this guy up to say, hey, I'm going to go and get this new TV and then everything's going to be perfect. You right. know, I, I kind of feel like that's what happened to Lee. Yeah. You know, Lee was like, I've got this new TV. It's the it's a great, it's, you know, the newest technology, blah, blah, blah. It's got a small flaw. Yeah, well, I, we were even saying it, it was it was even more frustrating because it was so close to being perfect, but it wasn't perfect. And that was even more frustrating than mm -hmm. if it had been farther away. <laughs> He says, we mentioned when we were talking about LCD and OLED production facilities, the gener generation panel sizes that LG's displays a uh, new Gen 10.5 OLED plant might allow them to make an 88-inch OLED TV. If you follow that, you're better than me. I read the dang thing. Basically, he said that there that there's a new 88-inch TV, 88 TVs coming out. Maybe. Nick recalls that LG did have an 8K resolution. 88-inch OLED on display at CES this year, but it's strictly a prototype. Do we think they might have plans to actually might mass produce it, though? And if so, what sort of price point do we think it could have? 10 grand, 15 grand? Or it'll be so high that it's in, in, into the if-you-have-to-ask territory. Dude, they are 100% going to bring out 8K displays. Yep. There's no oh, chance. Yeah. And, and guess what? After that, there's going to be 16K displays. <laughs> it's co I mean, they got to do something. Yeah. Until they come up with holographic technology or something like that, they got to do something to sell more TVs. They can't say, oh, yeah, 4K, that's it, man. I mean, huh? yeah. No, tw 2020 yeah. was the year. You know, 2020, it's the uh, the Olympics that are being held in Japan. Yeah. Uh, they've been going on about their super high vision uh, 8K resolution thing for, you know, a decade now. And, yeah. uh, and that was the target. In fact, Rec 2020, most of the SMPTE uh, numbers are arbitrary or just go in sequential order, but they chose 2020. That one was given to it specifically because they were aiming for the year 2020. Uh, right. So they will absolutely release an 8K 88-inch OLED in 2020. I have almost no doubt about that at all. I really think it's coming. I think it'll be about at least twenty thousand dollars, probably twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, I was gonna say something higher than that, but yeah, that's, it's, there, well, because that's when the seventy seven inch came out. Right. Originally, it was in the twenty to twenty five thousand dollar range, and I I think that's what uh, the I mean, it might be even more. We are talking about going right. to a whole new resolution class, but LG is always aggressive on pricing, and I think they really want to actually sell some of these. And I think twenty five thousand dollars that that's my guess. I'm putting I'm throwing that out there for uh, I don't know steak dinner bet. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it'll be closer to the 50 grand. But okay. It could be. You never know. Would the existence of an 88-inch 88 88 inch OLED make a strong case for foregoing a projection setup? If you sit just a bit closer, you can still have the same field of view, and it will unquestionably be brighter and have higher contrast, even with a bit of ambient light presence. So would we ever recommend going with a projector if there's 88-inch OLEDs out there? Uh, okay, first of all, yeah, you're absolutely right. 88-inch mm -hmm. TV, that was affordable yeah <laughs> would would absolutely hey i think 75 inch tvs and in a lot of cases 65 inch tvs you know people sit pretty close sometimes pretty close to their tvs but 65 not close inches, to a projector setup but yeah i know 88 inches is 100 percent into the you know, oh i mean if you were thinking into, about a 92 inch screen going I, down i have a 92 inches. inch screen <laughs> i would definitely take an 80 inch OLED yeah. right now <laughs> like pass it over yeah yeah for 100 percent but 
it's going to be some time before we see those that size TV yeah. at, a, at a price that rivals what you can do with a projector. But like 85-inch LCDs exist today yeah. at prices that are, I mean, they're expensive, but they're not completely out of the realm of possibility for a lot of yeah. people. So, yeah. uh, so I mean, 88-inch OLED, it's going to be a while before that's affordable. But an 85-inch TV, uh, for certainly, I mean, if you were going, I'm getting a 92-inch projector, but I want to have ambient light, I'd be like, get an 85-inch TV, because that's yeah. that's certainly close enough. Uh, but if you were going for a 135-inch or 150-inch, you're still nowhere close. And the pri- if you were like, the only way I'm going to do this if it's is if it's an OLED, then the price difference is going to be so big for so long yeah. that... Yeah, projector still makes sense. We'll be pro- recommending projectors for years to come yet. Right. Another alternative to projectors might be Samsung's micro LED, the wall display, which we talked about at the top sure. of the podcast. But can we remind him, he seems to recall tech reporters mentioning some drawbacks that, that they're a bit of a barrier for deploying these in homes, something about pixel density, perhaps. Can we clarify that for him? Uh I actually was thinking the same thing, but it, it, to my mind, I thought we, we said that these things are so, I mean, it's, the L, they're they're small yes. and they're close together, but they ain't that close together. No, I mean, I mean it was 4K resolution at 146 inches. Right. So to shrink the the 4K resolution down to I don't let's even say 88 inches, right? You're talking about the pixel density having to become almost twice as dense. If you want it smaller yeah. than that, like if you want, like the people who keep talking about micro LED being a competitor to OLED, I'm like, no, they're a completely different class things. Yeah, they are. You're going to be is... so far back from these things for there not to yeah. be visible edges between the, the Yeah, plus the, the modular display, they're made up of individual, almost like tablets, essentially, right. stitched together. And people were like, if you get like within about eight feet of that, you can see the seams, <laughs> right? Now, yeah. eight feet, that a lot of people are sitting eight to 10 feet away and you don't want to see the seams in your display. So this is meant for a, a theater, a home theater. Right, right. An uh, actual, you know, 30 foot. Yeah, you know. where you're sitting 15, 16, 17 yeah. feet away from the thing. And then it then it makes sense. Then it's great. And if you can afford it, by all means, it's. I mean, it's certainly going to be brighter than any projector. You can have ambient light on with the thing. But yeah, I don't see micro LED as being a competitor to OLED at all. Um, and Not it, yet. very expensive. Uh, the other one where he might have had some confusion is um, the we, they were talking about micro LED and Samsung's cinema display, the 34 foot wide one at the same time. And the cinema display, they're like, those are real, like actual LEDs, not micro LEDs. And those you have to be at least one picture height away before you just don't see dots. You like don't see LEDs. <laughs> it look like pointillism. So, so on that one, you got to be uh, 17 feet away from the 34 foot wide screen uh, just to not see dots. Uh, and in fact, if you want a normal field of view, you got to be like 30 feet away. So yeah, uh, that might've been where some of the confusion came from. But still on the micro LEDs, there is the pixel density thing as well you, you can't yeah, be this is gonna be something that's gonna be great on like cruise ships sure you know what i mean they put it above the pool <laughs> yeah or on the dance yeah. floor right yeah yeah all right mike mike says thanks for all the advice about his soundproof basement theater build from last week he says we'll pro- he'll probably go with pretty much everything we said yeah and just to clarify his equipment rack will be out that's that guy Mm -hmm. will be outside of his theater it will be in his utility room and the only things in this theater will be sources that use physical media so that's why he wanted the 50 foot hdmi runs and before tom says you just put the players outside the room too the main one he cares about the xbox one and more than just the discs he's it's the controller that uh, concerns him he doesn't want any issues with this wireless range or sending its signals through double stud walls and all that yep dude there's got to be a repeater for that is it though those bluetooth they're not right they're rf i don't know i think they're bluetooth controllers i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure no well no i'm i'm 100 sure it's rf because Eh. bluetooth is uh well there's the bluetooth low latency thing that they use so but there's bluetooth for the ps3 and it's always been a sort of contention Mm -hmm. you know with your harmony remotes uh, if you haven't used it in a while, you have to like reconnect yeah, that's and right. it becomes yeah. kind of a pain. And that's not the case with the Xbox One. So I'm pretty True. sure it's RF. Okay. Um, that being said, I'm, there's got to be repeaters for those things. But fine, whatever. You want your 50-foot runs, get your 50-foot runs. I don't care. <laughs> He's got some questions, though, apparently. We didn't answer enough. 
If you were to go for in-wall surrounds instead of wall mounting bookshelf speakers, what would we recommend? In wall versus wall mounting. Well, I don't remember what speakers we recommended last time. Well, he was he already had his Elax, and we're like, just mount those and use the oh, okay. side. We said use the side clamping mounts because he was he wants SVS speakers in the future, and we're like, you can just swap them out. You get right, 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 SVSs, right, 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 right. you can swap them out if you have the side clamping mounts. But he's like, eh, maybe I want something a little lower profile, maybe even in wall. What would we recommend? Well, in wall, I, I mean, if, if just to be safe, uh -huh. I'd probably go with something like uh, RBHs. Sure. And, there, and, and I mean, I don't know if the price wise, this really makes sense, but RBHs uh, are just a very neutral yeah. speaker that will play nice anything. with just about anything. So that would be like my go to sure. suggestion here. Uh, now, once we talk about price and stuff like that and size and form factor, then that maybe they get uh, dismissed because yeah. on those grounds. But just as a general all around, hey, I want to buy this speaker and I'm going to buy different speakers in the future, but I don't know which ones I'm going to buy. I'm going to say go with RBH because at the very least, I'm pretty sure that unless the speakers you buy to go with them are seriously you know, unique yeah. in their sound, they'll play fine with the RBHs. I can agree with that. But in his case, since he's so concerned about soundproofing, I'm like, just don't put big holes in your walls. Just don't. Yeah, do I walls. agree with that. Too. Uh, I mean, you can, the, you know, soundproofing company, they have the whole soundproof backer box that you can build and all right. that up. I'm like, just, it's still a big hole in your wall. I wouldn't even risk it because there are good on wall speakers. And that's what I sure. would recommend. Ones I really like are Focal's Super Birds. Um, and right now, right this moment, as I'm saying it, who knows how long this will go on, but Accessories for Less is having a buy one, get one free sale on those. There so $300 go. will get you a pair of Focal Superbirds, and they are nice and flat, and they can play shockingly loud given their size. So uh, even if you want full reference volume, really good on-wall choice. RBH also has a really nice on-wall, their Ultra 1, their Ultra say, Series. They have an on-wall as well. I, thought, I just yep. saw that today, the flat ones. They look, they look kind of cool. They are cool, and they're very, very flat. So yeah, uh, yeah a couple of... I would I would go on wall all the way in this setup. All right, there you go. What do we think of using the Focal Superbirds as on what he, we like it? Yeah. Uh, but then still using the Elac debut bookshelf speakers that he already owns as his surround backs. Would they be close enough matched not to sound distracting? Yeah, they'll be fine. Going. On. Oh, overall, yeah, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> Rob's like, wait, that's it? <laughs> no, I mean overall, I'd say yeah. I, the surround backs are so unimportant as far as our oh, ability to hear uh, yeah, timbre yeah. mismatches that uh, yeah, I'm inclined to say that's fine. Yeah. Bob back in the Philippines. Bob would just like some clarification regarding the names of some of the picture settings for his LG OLED TV. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be under action. <laughs> the action. No, that's Sony, man. That's <laughs> oh, Sony. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between OLED light and brightness? And does changing the one of them affect the other? That is, if you make a change to one of them, do you need to make sure that you check the other one again and, and sort of go back and forth until you get things just right? Now, I do not know the answer to this question, so I am going to guess, and then okay. you're going to tell me whether or not I'm right. All right. It, OLED light is the overall, uh, that, that light output from the the back, you know, sort of the <laughs> the, the overall light, like the, because LCDs have the, the, the back, the back light, light, right? Yeah. But OLEDs don't. But no. I'm guessing that the L the OLED light is that. Yeah, it's it's brightness... very much akin to the backlight setting of an LCD. Yeah. yeah, and the brightness is the brightness setting like a normal TV would have. Yeah, brightness really should be called black level. I yeah. wish they would just rename it. I don't know why they're still going with the brightness and contrast, which we're going to be ca talking about contrast next. But the brightness setting is your black level setting, and you can actually use a test pattern to make sure that you are not crushing any detail in your blacks and that you also haven't raised that brightness setting right. so high that you're seeing what is supposed to be below black information. Because there is such a thing in the signal as below black and you're not supposed to see it. It's below black. So the way to do this is your OLED light setting should be used to set your maximum nit level, your maximum peak level. That's what you use the OLED light setting for. The overall, how bright does the image look in an overall sense? Set that where you like it. I highly recommend you go into the expert settings of any picture mode, go to the white balance setting, and there, there is an inner test pattern. If you set it to the 20 point scale, you can scale through from five IRE up to 100 IRE in five IRE steps. You set it to 100 IRE, you set your OLED light based on that until that looks how bright you want full white to look. And then you go back and set your contrast and brightness settings, your black level. And we'll be talking about contrast next, your white level. Okay. So what about the settings, contrast and dynamic contrast? What's the difference between those two? All right. Again, I'm going to guess. Contrast is normal contrast, but is dynamic contrast the HDR contrast? 
No, not quite. So contrast yeah. is, it should be called white level. Yeah. In a signal, there is information that is above white. You're not supposed to see it. It's above white. But you also want the contrast setting set high enough so that you aren't losing any detail in the whites. You aren't clipping the detail. And again, there are test patterns. You can use that uh, THX tune-up app if you want to do that. It does a fantastic job for that. Uh, or you can pop in any old THX DVD or any Blu-ray that had the, the setup patterns. Yeah, but if you put the THX DVD and make sure you put on an RE, REQ. <laughs> it's real important. It has nothing to do with audio. Uh, but yeah, that's your, your so <laughs> brightness is your black level, contrast is your white level. Dynamic contrast is uh, well, almost a can of worms, but it is dynamically changing the gamma of your display. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> so gamma is the rate of change from black to white. So there are industry-wide standards. If you have light, your gamma is supposed to be 2.2. If you're in a dark room, it's supposed to be 2.4. They've actually completely ratified a thing for a standard dynamic range now called BT1886, which gives exact values. This is exactly how much light could, should come out of your display uh, based on the signal, but that's all gamma. It's the rate that from uh, at, like how quickly does your TV get brighter based on the signal? Well, dynamic contrast, dynamically adjusts the gamma based on the content on screen. So it's when a very dark image, they might, uh, let's see, lower the numerical value of the gamma a bit to bring out more detail in the shadows. And in a very bright scene, they might raise the numerical value of the gamma to make sure that uh, nothing looks like overblown or washed out or anything like that. So uh, dynamic contrast overall, you don't want to use the caveat though that Tom alluded to, if you have a 2017 OLED and only the 2017 models, the ones that ended in a seven, if you're watching HDR10 and only HDR10, you will want to set dynamic contrast to low because that's where LG hid their ability to <laughs> remaster HDR10 content so that it looks correct into the dynamic contrast setting for everything Everything else you want it turned off and if you don't have a 2017 lg oled you want it turned off there you <sighs> go. travis travis uses his pc as his music audio source is plugged into a monster cable surge protector that claims to filter the power and the surge protector is plugged into a J gfci outlet ground fault circuit interrupter yeah whatever he uses a pc sound card i like to call it the thing my wife's hair dryer trips uh -huh. and then no nothing works in the bathroom for a while and until i go press the it's button the, it's the don't get it wet or oh the idea is if you get it <laughs> wet, put, it will save your life that's right they, they have i don't someone uh, they, they have them in weird places in this house it's very disturbing should be in your bathroom should be in your garage anywhere that you actually might get the outlet wet. not in the garage definitely in the bathroom there's a couple in the kitchen in the kitchen not yeah. sure why yeah not sure why no, They're sink. Not you in, might be splashing that water the, around man not near the sink you might be <laughs> You might be throwing it behind your I would have to have a water fight in my house. Your refrigerator might, you know, flood and vent or There's whatever. one outside. Oh, yeah. Outside. That makes sense. Yeah. That one, that one, that one does trips all the time. He uses a PC sound card that has an optical audio output, and he uses an optical audio cable to connect to a receiver that powers the speakers. Overall, he says he has extremely low noise for almost completely inaudible, but isn't quite dead silent. So where in that long signal chain from the electrical outlet all the way to the speakers would that last remaining bit of noise be coming from? <laughs> where in the signal chains, chain do you pick up that noise, and where would you have to place a filter in order to eliminate it? Mm. Alright, there's a couple things you can do here. It's plugged into a... To receiver. So yeah. the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to check your receiver. So turn the don't uh, uh, you turn it to a, an input that doesn't have anything in it. Okay. Going into. Or heck, then, you, you can just unplug everything from the receiver except yeah. for your speakers and the power cable. Everything That's else right. unplugged. And then listen. Yeah. Listen to nothing. Listen to silence. Silence. Yeah. yeah. Don't play anything. Just say, if you still hear it. It's the receiver, it's, that, and that's almost certainly where it I, is. I, I hundred, I, I like, I, I'm like ninety nine percent sure because that's where it's coming from. I've never come across an amplifier, an audio amplifier, no. yeah, that it has at least a little bit no noise floor at all. Yeah, like so. Even the ATIs that I'm a really big fan of, if you press your ear up against your tweeter, there's still a very slight little hiss. Right. Um, yeah. So it's almost certainly just the amplifiers in your receiver, but could it be anything else? Yeah. Could he do anything about it? No. Well, I mean, no. I mean, if it's the amplifiers, <laughs> in the, I, I suppose if your you receiver get... has pre-outs, you could try an even quieter amplifier, but don't expect dead si I mean, literal dead silence from any you know, This amplifier. is one of those uh, those situations where, well, okay. The, the other thing I thought that it could be, and the, first of all, the 
monster power thing that's not doing nothing nah. uh i don't think your pc sound card because it's all connected by optical is doing anything i don't think there's no sen- optical anything. certainly isn't sending i mean everything up upstream of your right. amplifiers could add little bits of noise here and there and by the time all of that noise adds up and gets to the amplifier the amplifier will amplify that noise along with right. the rest of the signal but you said you have an almost completely inaudible noise flow already which means that indicates everything upstream of your amplifiers is already very quiet. There's right. essentially nothing you can do to the rest of your signal. The only other thing that came to my mind when we were when I was looking at this question was: Does your content when it is when you're listening to it mm-hmm. is the dead spaces between your content actually silent? Right. Because <laughs> there are plenty of recordings that I have CDs, DVDs, whatever that the dead space is not dead quiet. There's still a little bit of hiss in the background of that recording sure. and you when you press stop you hear it goes you hear it go away right so that was the to me that's the really the only other possible culprit that i could think of no i have a recommendation for travis which is i think travis should start listening to a lot of vinyl oh yeah you'll get real used to it because then when you go back to this you'll be like there's no noise at all <laughs> <laughs> I, okay so what could he do the only other thing i think he could do theoretically I mean, first of all, you could just turn the volume down until you can't hear it Well, no, because the noise floor is still... I mean, the noise floor is inherent to the amplifiers. I'm almost certain of it. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. But if you turn the... Oh, I see what you're saying. It'll be the same no matter what Yeah, the noise floor is going to be the same no matter what the volume level. Uh, There's one thing. You could go track down one of the old Panasonic receivers that used genuinely digital amplifiers. Now, those things were dead silent until anything started playing. Then they weren't perfectly linear and they weren't perfect <laughs> amplifiers, but up to that moment, when it they was silent, great. they yeah. were dead silent. No, um, the- Harder the, to drive speakers could be, you know, like if you have a speaker that's mm. particularly hard to drive, then that hiss won't make it through. Right, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, if they're it, super it, efficient, you'll hear the hiss more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. if you got hard to drive speakers, perhaps something that's, you know, doesn't, that takes a lot of amplifier power. Yeah. Could, could, that'd be very, about the only way Very you could inefficient. It yeah, that could be yeah. a way. But I think pursuing perfection is uh, ruining an excellent experience. Because what he described is already excellent, but he wants perfection. And there's really, I mean, I suppose there's theoretically such a thing, but uh, nah. Uh, what you've got yeah. is, is about as good as it gets, Travis. Michael on Twitter. Michael Hurst mentioned that when we use an up mixer like DTS Neural X, we like to use the game mode variant rather than the movie or music variant. So we gave it a try and he was shocked pleasantly by the results. Why does DTS Neural X in game mode sound so much better? It obviously <laughs> sounded clearer to him with better delineation and no distracting change in timbre like in the other modes or other up mixers he's tried previously. How and why? Well, I mean, I think Rob's talked about enough times but basically the game mode is trying to make each channel as distinct as possible Mm -hmm. so it's it's tending to do as little to the signal as it possibly can why is that because gamers want to be able to hear what's if something is behind them very clearly so they know directions yeah and people who are watching movies or maybe music they have a different so they would or maybe prefer a slightly different experience where it's a little bit more smeared, a little bit more diffuse. And uh, those modes are great for those experiences. And but those of us that really want to hear everything the way that was that it was originally mixed uh, and maybe have a little bit more clarity out of our channels, like the game mode. Yeah, any of the up mixers, uh, what they're doing, they're taking the original signal, analyzing that, deciding some sounds are going to go into other speaker channels that didn't exist in the original signal, whether they're overheads or ones that are behind you, or if it's a stereo signal, all of your speakers are getting sounds that were never in the original signal to begin with. Uh, the game mode in the DTS Neural X or DTS Neo X is simply saying, okay, I've analyzed the signal. These sounds are going to get played out of these different speakers, but they're only going to get played out of those speakers. I'm not going to duplicate those sounds or add reverb to any of those sounds they're just these are the sounds i'm sending to these speakers and only those speakers get to play them so it's a more distinct more discreet and that eliminates things like if you have two different speakers playing the same sound slightly out of phase that can alter the timbre or you might get intermodulation distortion so Mm -hmm. it eliminates all those things and it sounds clean and distinct and precise so having been so impressed by dts neural x game mode he tried listening to some other formats like dolby digital plus 
5.1 from Netflix, just in Dolby Digital Plus listening mode, but he activated the listening mode by pressing the game button on his receiver's remote rather than the movie or music or pure buttons. But that didn't produce any noticeable difference. How come? I gotta admit, I'm a little confused by this question because I don't know what he means. So, you know, when you're watching a content yeah. and on your, like you have a Denon, uh, on yours, uh, there's the listening mode buttons. There's yeah. movie, music, game, and pure listening mode buttons. And you yeah. press any of those and you'll get a list of all the available listening modes under that um, under that button, right? So you have the, right. the movie list of listening modes, the music list of listening modes, and so on. So all of them, movie, music, and game, not the pure, but movie, music, and game, will have just the straight decoding for whatever you're listening to. If you're listening to a Dolby True HD, Dolby True HD will be one of the available listening modes. Right. Uh, Dolby Digital will be one of the listening modes. But if it's not original... doing anything to the signal at that point. It's just... You're just listening to the straight signal. Yeah. to the straight signal. If so that's if the you listening mode you're choosing is just the straight decode, there is no difference between music, movie, and game. It should be all the same. Yeah. They're all exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. So he, he asks, why didn't you try this a long time ago? Yeah. I don't know, dude. When you got to look at yourself in the mirror every morning and ask yourself the question, why didn't we do what Tom, why didn't do what Tom and Rob suggested? Yeah, there you go. Some sometimes you're going to have a very long, very, very, <laughs> con, very depressed you're life gonna, now that you've got you've gone through this with us. We're we're going to be so. the guys on AVS. We're going to be like, you've got to go back and listen to every episode we ever did because the answer's in there, man. It's in there. You just you know, it's in there. You do, we're not gonna, we're not going to say it again. The time it took me to say like, this is as long as it would have taken me to repeat the answer. But no, go back and do it all again, man. I it's not like I don't have the page bookmarked and could just post the 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 the, the, the link Use for the you search. or or I could copy paste my answer from before. Yeah, right, no, yeah. no, I'm gonna berate you online <laughs> because I am very small and I feel very bad about that and I would like to make you feel small as well. Mm. Anywho, any opinion on which are the very best Atmos upward firing modules? <laughs> and what would be our go-to choice for Atmos speakers? In-ceiling model, on-ceiling model, uh, whatever works in the room. If I had mm. my <laughs> choice, it would be uh, in-ceiling. Okay. You know, I think that it just would, you know, it's, it's just less, a little bit less nicer. Less visual. And... Yeah. yeah. But upward firing modules, I think one of the best ones, kind of universally have been praised, have been the Klipsch. Yep. The Klipsch ones have been very well received, and uh, I, I would have no problems with recommending those. Yeah, Klipsch has a couple. They have one in their Reference Premiere series and one in their less expensive Reference series. I've heard the Reference Premiere one. Um, up until very recently, they were the ones I thought did the best job. I haven't heard the less expensive Reference series one, so I can't comment on that. But recently, I heard the PSB ones. Oh, PSB. And PSB they are my new favorites one. for upward firing nice. modules. And uh, interestingly, uh, PSB is the only company that I know of for sure. A definitive technology might have come close. But I think PSB is the only one who actually followed to the letter everything Dolby recommended for building yeah. an upward firing module. And it's almost as though Dolby knew what they were talking about because it works. Weird. I know. So weird. Who would have thought that the people who invented it actually made one that works really well? So I like the PSBs, uh, but they're they're not super inexpensive. <laughs> over five hundred dollars, I believe, for the pair of them. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, as far as upward firing, but none of them are as good as just having speakers up on your ceiling. Yeah. yeah um, I I do like the full cow little birds because you know they're easy to mount and you can pivot them and point them in any direction. And yeah, I know, I, I like but them. you know, it seems sort of silly to to. Uh, I mean. You can like pivot them in any direction. Yeah, you're going to pivot them until they fire straight, straight down. Straight down. I mean, that's yeah. really the only. It's what I'd recommend. <laughs> but uh, but they're easy yeah. to mount. I like yeah. them. Uh, for in ceilings, for just a general recommendation, I like the Outdoor Speaker Depot MK650s because they're a hundred dollars a pair, and for Atmos speakers, they're more than fine. Right. So uh, I like those. Jack, Jack thinks that maybe he's just an old fuddy duddy now. And maybe he's no longer hip or whatever. But what's the deal with chain brand speakers? Okay, dude, seriously. Are you trying to get us in trouble here? Oh, he's trying to get us in trouble. This is this is like such... It's not clickbait. It's like rage bait, <laughs> right? You're going to get people so mad at us. Because every time we talk about the speaker brand, somebody, <laughs> somebody will track finds us it on down YouTube and, and just can of worms. get super angry. 
Anyways, oh, do they there ever? are people on forums absolutely raving about them, but Jack uh -huh. hadn't ever heard of them before. And for some reason, they just seem a bit sketchy to him, like having <laughs> $27,000 a pair of speakers on the list on their website, but only for pre-order. You know what? That whole page, if you look at that page that has that, that every single one of those, that's just a Photoshop render, dude. There's oh, yeah. no actual speaker <laughs> on that page. Everything then, is in the your actual, mind. The actual ones that are under the chain brand, uh, I think one of them is available for sale right now, but the others are on back order. The A series something or whatever. But anyways, <sighs> so who's putting down the pause on that, he asked. Are they legit? The actual chain brand speakers, which are quite affordable at 340 a pair or 880 pair for the bookshelf or tower respectively really are, are really so much better than anything else close to that prior uh, price point like people in the forum are raving okay <laughs> so there is a phenomenon online and i don't think it has a name but it should have one and what happens is a manufacturer of i think probably any product at all uh i think within every product uh, every type of product that's out there there is a company that somehow makes this happen and what they do is they get a following and that following is rabidly obsessed with them and one of the things that they do is they 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 talk a good game and they make a lot of promises and they're very exciting and they're very dynamic and they offer discounts if you pre-order mm -hmm. and then they collect a whole bunch of money they ship some speakers <laughs> Or some products, and the people who get them love them, and then they then they stop making speakers and they just they abscond with the money. Now that doesn't always happen. Sometimes they turn into legit companies. A company that started very much this way was Axiom Audio. Mm -hmm. Axiom Audio had a massive following, and people were absolutely raving about their speakers and they they sold for a huge value and you got a lot of value for your speakers and they slowly turned into a you know they, they just grew and got bigger and put out more products and everything started getting more and more expensive until now people are like oh yeah axiom that's just another speaker company they weren't <laughs> always that way they were just like this the difference here is that this company has a long history yeah. of changing its name Doing this thing, putting out, getting people excited about them, putting out some speakers, and then disappearing, and then coming back as a different name. Yep. I am, and, and you know what? They may, this may be the time they go legit. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. All I right. Mean, the, but the, well, possibly you're because. You're not getting my money. That's for uh, sure. Craig, the guy who, um, so it would start out as Chase. It was Chase, Chase yeah. something. I don't. I think the Chase Home Theater came later, so it was Chase something. I think it was just right. Chase Subwoofers originally, and then it was Chase something else. Uh, so anyway, that that guy uh, is the one who was mostly responsible for opening company, getting pre-orders, delivering some products, and then closing down, and then wash and repeat. Um, eventually became Chain when he merged with another guy who was bring you know, impo importing speakers from China and selling them under his brand name, and they merged together. That's... Well. Swan speakers, I think, right? Uh, well, Swan has been around all over the place. I mean, they were yeah. back with AV123 as well, which is another one of these stories. Yep, yep, um, yep. And like, similar to AV123, the actual speakers, if you got them, were often quite good. Yeah. They they were legitimately often quite good speakers. I have That's reviewed not... Rocket, was it Rocket, yeah. the Rocket 123 or whatever yeah. they were speakers, and they were great speakers. I liked yeah. them. So that yeah. is often not the problem. The speakers themselves, if you get them, is often not the problem. But it's I wouldn't touch Chain with a 10-foot pole. Now, maybe <laughs> they're fine this time because Craig is gone. He's not part of this anymore. And now they're Chain Music Cinema because they ran through like every other name. They were yeah, Chain right. Home Theater. They were Chain Music. They were Chain Home Theater. They were Chain Sound. They were Chain something else. But now they're Chain Music Cinema because they were running out of URLs. Right. And maybe this is the time. But you know what? It's not a good sign when everything's out of stock and everything's for pre-order. Not a great sign again. I wouldn't touch I, I went to their ball. forums and it was it's it's very very, very familiar. Yeah. You know, all the talk in there and the people getting excited. It's an echo chamber of people being very excited. And you know what? If you got their speakers and you love them, I am very happy for you. Yeah. I got again nothing the speakers themselves are the speakers. probably fine. Yeah. I do have a problem with people asking me if I think they should buy their speakers and getting mad when I say you're, you're probably going to get ripped off. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean you might not. It's not as though might. there aren't alternatives from really reputable reputable com companies in this price range. So, there okay, are alternatives. Go to, go to Amazon. Okay, go to Amazon and read a review on almost any product. 
Okay, mm. and you will find that somewhere down the line, somebody has gotten a defective unit and was unhappy with it. Sure. All right, that happens. Right. So when I buy a product, I'm looking at all these reviews and I'm kind of weighing in my mind which ones are good, which ones are bad. You know, how how many people are having negative experiences versus how many people have positive experiences. And when you're looking down and there's like two or three people who are like, this is the best thing I've ever had. And then there's 16 people saying, uh, I never got mine or it was broken or it was an empty box or, you know what I mean? I had a hell that, of a time getting any kind of service or getting yeah, any answers to my emails. Then yeah, you just yeah, stay yeah, away yeah. from that product. And that's what we're telling you. Yep. No, that's what we're telling you. We're telling machine, you that they're, they've... some people are very excited by them because they got good products that they loved. Yep. And there's a lot of people out there that are either waiting, hoping, or mad. Yeah. And they have always based it on the fear of missing out thing. You know, yeah. here's the pre-order price. Don't miss out on it. These are the greatest the speakers ever. They get somebody out there to give them a positive review and they take it on and then wash and rinse and repeat. Yeah. yeah. So sorry if you're a chain fan. Uh, yeah. If you, yeah, I'm, I'm if sorry. If you've got their speakers, great. And you're happy with them, great. Fantastic. Even better. Good on you. Even better. But you should, you know, share them with the Given how many do. alternatives there are from reputable companies, no thanks. Yeah. Neil. Neil says he's a big fan of the podcast, and he's been listening since D D Dina was around. Almost a Dana. Oh, I'm getting tired. He, he thinks his current setup already sounds good, and he's never been unhappy with it, so he doesn't know if his room actually has any big problems. But whenever we talk about acoustic panels, he can't ha help but wonder if things could be better. So he dipped his toe, uh, dipped his toe by ordering a single GIC 242 art panel that he placed on his back wall, and he thinks it made a positive difference. So now he's wondering if adding more panels, this time on the side walls, would further improve things. He already has books, uh, bookcases that come up to hip height, uh, hip height on both walls <laughs> and back on uh, both side walls and the back wall. Will absorption panels placed above those have any further impact on the sound? Now I'm looking at his room now, mm -hmm. and you guys, you know, if you're on YouTube, you should be looking at it too. He's got a couch that's almost on the back. Okay, on the back wall there are bookshelves, but and computer. Multiple computers. Yep. Like you get monitors old, anyway. Old old Mac, buy Mac thing with the mm -hmm. big fat base thing, and then in, uh, in front of that, probably just enough space to get down there and look for the DVDs that are down there is a couch, a single couch with maybe three seats, maybe, and then on the front wall he's got some speakers, and uh, on the side walls he's got uh, bookcases as well, bookshelf as well, and the tweeter height on his speakers looks like it would be just uh, probably in line with the top of the bookshelf. Yeah, uh, so be right about there, and it it appears as though he's using a projector just on a blank wall. It doesn't appear to have a screen. Yeah, I don't see a screen anymore. And it is carpeted, so he's got at least that much. He's got carpet. So he's looking at places on this side walls, kind of above the bookshelves where he That's might right. put them. Would these make a difference up there? <sighs> I mean, not a ton to your first reflections because your no. bookcase is already taken that. And you know what? They're doing an okay job because they're acting as diffusers. Yeah, and, you know, I'll be honest with you. This room, I, I feel like base trapping might be the where I would put my money as far as uh, or on those absorption. angled parts of the <laughs> walls because those are those always create interesting reflections. Let's right, call them. right. Because he's so, got he's got kind of a kind of a camphored ceiling up there. So right. So I feel like if you could get some base trapping in here, you might be. Now it doesn't look like he's got many corners left. Mm. To be honest with you, there is a the side surrounds look like they're towers that are in the yep. corner, the, the yep. rear corners. Got towers of the for room. side surrounds, yep. Uh, and in the front left, there's a sub. It looks like in the back right, there's also a sub. And the bookshelves yep. go all the way to the front, it looks like on the right wall. Mm -hmm. So I don't see a whole lot of room for base trapping, but uh, really. I wouldn't be thinking about the first reflection points as much as I would be thinking about just getting some absorption up here. Yeah, and overall you... reducing the reverberation in the room. This is one of those cases where it's less about the distinct reflection and more about the overall, uh, there might be some echoing in this room. Although having the carpeting, having the bookcases acting as diffusers, it's not as bad as it might seem. Because we look at a big blank wall and we're like, it might be reflections in here, but you've got some absorption, you got some diffusion, so maybe a little bit I more. I don't not hate the idea of putting stuff on the ceiling or on those kind yeah. of angled walls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't hate that idea. I also don't hate the idea of if, if, if you could straddle something like right above the bookshelves and stuff, you know, and that like where three corners meet Yeah. On, on its front of the wall or the, I don't know if the back of the wall has it. It doesn't look like it has it. So, I mean, 
it really would be nice. I mean, how much difference would you notice? I don't know. Mm. You know, you may not notice that much. And, and it, it really comes down to this whole, uh, I never really noticed it. And it sounds pretty good to me statement. Yo. And yet, when he put the one panel behind him, he's like, ah, I noticed a difference with that. And it was a good one. So, so I mean, I think putting some a, a couple more up here, maybe four, I think. Yeah, because I'm thinking, you know, be again, we, I sort of hold to that 30-70 rule about 30% of your room being absorptive. And I think you're a little shy of that right now, just eyeballing it. But I would imagine if you calculated your total surface area, right. that right now you're a little shy of about 30% of the uh, of your room being absorptive. So I think a little bit more in here would probably be beneficial. But I wouldn't expect a life-altering difference. Yeah, um, I'll be honest yeah. with you. I He's got, and I didn't notice it until I saw the picture, he's actually got surround backs that are directly yes, behind his yeah. couch. Now, they're far enough away from his side surrounds where there's a physical difference, mm -hmm. but the angle-wise, it, it, you know, it's it, they're, they're kind of pretty close. I would su suggest trying a five-point, hmm. I guess, two setup and seeing how that affects things, too. You could Possibly. definitely... You could definitely put a little panel, like, like move your sides around, your surrounds in a little bit and put a panel, like, sort of in that corner right there mm -hmm. to uh, catch that sort of first reflection off of that wall and uh, also just do a little bit of base trapping in there. Uh, I like that idea. But, okay. Uh, and, and turning off the back surrounds and then seeing how that sounds. So All that's right. That's my other suggestion. Sure. He used the Odyssey Editor app to have a look at his before and after results. He thinks it looks like Odyssey did a nice job, but he says he has untrained eyes. So what do we think? Dude, you don't, you don't have to have a trained eye to see a flat line. <laughs> the flatter the line, the better it did. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure which one's the before and the after here, Rob. So you're going to have to help me out with that. Well, the, the green is the before and the red oh, is the, the after. Oh, the green is the before. These are just yeah. different. These, these are just are different di speakers. They, he, oh, he put, okay, okay. put one in for well, yeah. every single one of his speakers. You got and, that same... Uh, dip Sim that, that I was seeing in mine, that mid-range dip up there. Mid-range compensation dip. You can turn that off in the editor yeah. app if you want to. Yeah, and then uh, the rest of it looks pretty good to me. I yeah. Mean, I like it. Now, I mean, what this is only the frequency response, though, so we're not seeing uh, what's happening in the time domain, and that's right. really what the acoustic panels are for, is to reduce any ringing, reverberation, that type of thing. So your frequency response is looking darn good in any of these speakers. You know, right. we don't have to go through every single one of them to get the idea that your frequency response is looking quite good. So I'm not too concerned about that. Again, if you did add more absorption, I think you might notice a slight but not earth-shattering difference. It would be a positive change. Yeah. So he says Gick offers several different panel options. They've got smaller spot panels, regular two, uh, 242 panels, 242 panels with a scatter plate, and their alpha and impression panels uh, that seem similar to the 242 panels plus the scatter plate, but the diffusion is all funky looking and visible on the outside. <laughs> they are kind of cool looking, some of those patterns. I have not I've not looked at that. I would He asked what we recommend. I would just recommend getting some regular old panels. I don't think you need any of the scatter plate stuff, to be honest with you. You've no, got you've got diffusion already. Diffusion already in this yeah. room so i would just get the regular old panels yeah and uh you know get them the color that you think is pleasing to, you know or, or get more get more room. art ones if you want art ones yeah. and since it's we are recommending just them. regular panels if you want art ones that are a little bit less expensive than gig uh check out acoustamac because yeah. they have printed panels that are a little bit less expensive than gigs and uh just for just absorption they'll do just as well all right we're going to do this next question then we're done okay chris Chris was running a 5.1.4 setup using his Denon X4300H receiver and his Ascend Acoustic Sierra 2 speakers up front as his LCR. He recently moved, now space to expand to 7.1.4. He already has 11 speakers, uh, so why not? Yeah. But the, the X4300H only has 9 amps, so welcome to my world, sir. <laughs> I did the same thing. So what's a good cost, good low cost two channel amp to power his surround back speakers? It's mm -hmm. the, hold on a second, let me look. The, the uh, Parts Express uh, APA100. Except that that's that doesn't it. exist anymore. Oh. Now um, it's the APA102, which is a class D, which for your surround back is totally fine. I'd have no right. problem with that. But uh, there is the Audio Source Amp 100, which is also on sale right now for $100. So there's no difference there in go. price. And that's a class AB. So uh, I kind of like the class AB still a little bit better. 
I do too. Um, just on a general purpose type of thing. That's going to open a whole can of worms, isn't it? Oh, well, more questions for not even next week. Next week is going to be all questions that we got this week. I can yeah. almost guarantee it. Uh, but yeah, Audio Source Amp 100 or the Dayton Audio APA 102. Those are both great $100 two channel amps that will drive your surround back or your uh, top rear speakers absolutely perfectly. So he remembers the horror story about this fellow uh, CR2 owner who damaged his ribbon tweeters, possibly due to an insufficient amplifier power. Mm. Should he be scared? How far away are you sitting? Oh, he's going to say. His front speakers will be roughly 10 feet from his seat, and he pretty much never listens at full reference volume. But if he wants to eliminate all anxiety about his amplifiers <laughs> ever possibly clipping, what's a good three-channel amp that, he could, that, that would totally have him covered as far as his CR2s go? Uh, let's see here. We've got uh, Emotiva. Sure. You could buy something from them, pretty much just about anything. And I would recommend, uh, since the Sierra 2s uh, can handle 150 watts continuously, uh, they, they can handle more peak power than that, but continuously 150 watts. Uh, so Emotiva has a nice model called the A5175. That goes it's got for five amps in it, though, doesn't it? It's five amps, but it's eight hundred. Well, they don't have a an inexpensive three channel, right? Uh, They've got the XPA three, but that's twelve hundred dollars. Uh, now, granted, that's like two hundred and seventy five watts per channel, but you don't need that many watts per channel, and it's twelve hundred dollars. Eight hundred dollars for the five one seven five, and then hey, you power two other of your speakers with it, or you know what? That's five channel amp, so it could power the front three and the ones he has to power externally, right? So you do right. it all. Uh, so, well, although who, yeah, yeah, you'd be powering the fronts externally anyway, so uh, whatever. That's the one I would get from me, Motiva. 800 bucks, 5175. Uh, but if you want, if you want, uh, like the ultimate, uh, Monoprice, Monolith, they've got a three channel amp. The Monolith 3 is $1,100. <laughs> Total overkill. Let's say, what is it, 1100 So $300 more for two less channels of amplification. That's right. But more wattage per channel that you don't actually need. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So uh, kind of tough to make that case. But, oh, it, it would eliminate all fear of ever that. say, there's all sorts of amps you can go out there, too. You just buy directly from ATI. You could really pay some you sure money could. for that. Yes. But uh, honestly... Um, I still feel really bad. I forget, I'm forgetting that fellow's name who had the Sierra 2s where the ribbon tweeter tore. Um, yeah. But that is the one and only case I have ever come across. I've gone looking because it was a fear. I own those speakers too. It was a fear of mine. I went looking and it hasn't happened <laughs> to other people. I don't know what happened in his case. It seems like it was some kind of anomaly. A sense stood behind it and sent him replacement ribbons. So... I don't think it's something you need to fear. I don't think you even need to do this. <laughs> 10 feet away really shouldn't be a problem. But hey, that uh, 5175 for 800 bucks is a very nice amplifier. So wouldn't be you know, better than a kick the, in the teeth. The amp you just suggested too. You know, the... Oh, the, the audio source. Little one. Yeah, the audio source. For he sure. used that for his front two channels. 60 watts. Well, it won't be a center channel, but whatever. That's right. All right. That's it for this week. Who do we have left over? We got lots. I we, know. Have, I, we have 12 <laughs> people left. Like I say, next week might be all remaining for this week. We but had 28 I, questions. We on, had 28 questions on the list this on week. The that is the list. most we've ever had. It was 28 pages that I wrote up this week. So, yes. you know. So when I the pushed the podcast back by a day, Rob was like, thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I was not upset about that. I mean, honestly, I didn't have to fill in all 28 questions because there was no way we were going to answer 28 questions in yeah. one podcast. But let's go through. We have Jorge, Jason, Andrew, who wrote to us on Facebook, Biv, who also wrote to us on Facebook, Corey. Uh, I guess I should be saying last initial, shouldn't I? Yeah, I don't care. Corey B. Uh, Dre W. Because uh, there's so many Dre's that rocked in. Pictures there's the there. doctor and there's this dude. Yep. Uh, Clara R, who wrote to me on Twitter. Uh, Russell T, who wrote on Facebook. Uh, Nick, who is in Australia, and I didn't get a last initial, but he's the Nick in Australia. Uh, Lior oh, M, Fred R, and scrolling past some pictures there as well, we have Daniel C. I, I'm right. pretty sure that's an entire podcast. That's probably a podcast. Oh, we'll get you guys next week, and anybody else got a question, you'll be the week after, I suppose. We'll attempt. We'll, we'll, we will get to all questions. We don't leave anybody behind, but it's first in, first out. And, uh, yeah, you're on the list. Yeah. So uh, if you want your question answered, just email us at question at avrant.com. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Robert for going to www.avrant.com, clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, and leaving us a PayPal donation. Thank you very much, Robert. Yeah, Robert, thank you very much for that donation. Thank you to our 61 patrons over at patreon.com especially Jorge, 
who is one of our patrons. They uh, the monthly Patreon takes some money from them and gives part of it to us. So yeah. thank you very much for your donations. Yeah, that is patreon.com slash podcast. if you would like to sign up. Thanks so much to our 61 patrons, and thank you, Jorge, for being one of them. I also want to thank Michael for letting Shu know that uh, he bought some speakers because uh, some subwoofers because of us. One we subwoofer to replace the two he had before. Yeah, yeah to, to thank Ash for uh, creating our new 600 logo. Yeah, Michael, congrats on that purchase. And Ash, thank you so much. We always love Ash's work. It's great stuff. Yeah. All right. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andrew. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.